Rappaport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, October 15th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps and steps and steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, senior correspondent at Vox, Ian Milheiser, on Amy Coney Barrett and the future of the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, as the Senate blocks real relief, the Republicans plot to undermine a potential Biden presidency. Meanwhile, 8 million have slipped into poverty following the end of federal aid. And tonight we have dueling town halls as NBC platforms Trump despite his avoiding a debate. Joe Biden has a double-digit lead nationally, but swing state registrations should have you concerned. Federal judge strikes down a Tennessee abortion obstruction law. We'll see how long stuff like that lasts in the new SCOTUS era. Meanwhile, another federal judge says North Carolina absentee ballots will need witness signatures. While another federal judge gives Virginia an extension on registration because of that fiber cable cut. Desperate Biden smear falls apart and crashes on its launch pad, but raises the problems with the size and dominance of social media platforms. New CDC report masks and closures led to a 75% decline or decrease, I should say, in Arizona's coronavirus cases. Xi Jinping tells its military to prepare for war in advance of a Trump plan to sell weapons to Taiwan. Things are getting even more hairy on the Armenia-Azerbaijan border. All this and more on today's program. Welcome to the show, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hope all is uh, well. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today is the uh, final day of the Supreme Court hearings, uh, and um, there'll be no testimony from Amy Coney Barrett. She I was going to say answered all of her questions over the past two days, but I should say she did not answer all of her questions and finished uh, yesterday. I mean, some of the questions that she refused to answer were quite stunning. And um, we'll talk to Ian Melheiser about the, um, you know, the, the Democratic strategy of actually attending these hearings and whether it was worth it. Uh, today, this morning, there was uh, simply there was old business, I guess, for the Judiciary Committee, or I'm not exactly sure what the parliamentary, uh, but there were moments where we heard uh, various sides talk about the process in general, and then they moved on to the uh, questioning of, of I guess, uh, witnesses who were testifying on behalf or against the nomination. Uh, Sheldon Whitehouse has really impressed me uh, in these hearings. Yesterday, I had mentioned that he did a long extended run uh, on the case of Friedrich and Janice, which both very important cases Janus, obviously, uh, more so because it was, in fact, uh, adjudicated by the Supreme Court. Friedrich was not because of the death of Scalia. Very important cases in terms of material implications on our society and unions. 
but also a great way to understand the uh, the process of the Supreme Court. And if I have time, I will play the entire six minute clip at the end of this um, hour today and walk you through it, because I think it's that important for people to to be aware and have an awareness of the Supreme Court. And then uh, White House this morning said, um, you guys pointing to the Republicans, your credibility is shot. We're not going to do this thing where Democrats play by the rules. And you guys don't anymore. When you come to us complaining that we're changing the rules later, remember this moment. I hope there were other members of that committee and uh, on the Democratic side that heard that. Meanwhile, Donald Trump is going to be uh, doing a town hall tonight at 8 p.m. Now, Joe Biden was scheduled to do a town hall at 8 p.m. on ABC because he was supposed to be doing a debate that Donald Trump did not end up showing up for. And then NBC apparently offered Donald Trump the exact same uh, slot. So we'll talk more about that later in the program. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I I don't know if I would I would indulge uh, the ratings for that myself. But here is Donald Trump. He is on the. uh, On the campaign trail, he's going around doing his rallies again, and uh, he's got a lot of energy. Boy, oh boy, I wish I had that kind of energy. I'll tell you what, if you could bottle that kind of energy. (laughs) Anyways, um, here he is. Here is his closing argument, I guess, in this uh, rally. Uh, Not of the rally, but just this is what we call with two and a half weeks left of an election. They start, you start getting into the closing argument. Why should we vote for Donald Trump? It's time to focus. You hear the news? Bruce Orr is finally out of the Department of Justice. Bruce Orr. Him and his wonderful wife, Molly. She wrote all this stuff, and then he goes and he works at the Department of Justice, and he took it. Didn't he bring it to the FBI? The wife writes it. She gets paid a lot of money. Bruce Orr is finally out of the Department of Justice. That's good. A couple of years too late, that's all. Pause it. Pause it for a second. But... I, I follow this stuff professionally. I have no idea who Bruce Orr is. I never say, have you ever heard of me? Has, has anybody, have you ever even come across the name Bruce Orr? It sounds like a hockey player. I mean, I, th- I feel like this is something if I followed the DOJ closely, I would know who Bruce Orr, but I mean, well, Bobby Orr was a very uh, prestigious uh, hockey player for the Bruins. He was one of the best, but I don't think that's the same guy. Bobby Orr would be significantly older at this point. Google Bruce Orr. They got people applauding. Bruce Orr is finally out of the DOJ. This is my closing argument, ladies and gentlemen. Google Bruce Orr. Let's see what we got. Bruce Orr news. Uh, LeVon Adams Orr obituary inside innovation. The effect of uh, analytical strategies. Oh, the CEO of Pro Norris or whatever it is. I don't think Lakeside Fishing makes <laughs> team makes a splash. Wait, there it is. Four weeks ago, another ex-Trumpers voting for Biden. Here's why. And then Bruce Orr is like the third name after Strzok and P- Lisa Page. And then there's somebody who wrote a book about a female serial killer that wasn't. Another obituary. Uh, Kareem Orr, that's a, uh, I, I don't know, I guess maybe it looks like a football player. Then a Twilight competition set for bowls. Who is he talking about? And how are so many people applauding that Bruce Orr doesn't have a job anymore? Woo-hoo. And poor Mary. It's a very odd closing argument. Continue, though, because he wants to bring up this, um, this supposed story in the, the New York Post about Burisma again, except for he has trouble doing it. The Department of Justice. That's good. A couple of years too late, that's all. He should be not only in the Department of Justice outbox, he should be someplace else, okay? Eight months after his alleged meeting with the Burmese executives. So this uh, Burmese, Burmese, they say, pronounce it Burmese. Burmese, what? 
they, they were basing his whole campaign on uh, Burisma, and he can't even say the word now? What is going on with this guy? He has a lot of energy, but he doesn't seem to have full control of his, um, his mouth. Uh, I, I did a little bit of digging, and it looks like the Bruce Orr mentioned in the, the Independent is maybe the, a wrong spelling, or here's a different Bruce Orr. This is the one he's talking about, it looks like. O-H-R. So oh. I've never heard of this guy, but he's linked to the Steele dossier, apparently. Oh, I see. So. Bruce Orr. Finally, so Bruce Orr is out. Wow. So we have to update the uh, spelling on our upcoming Bruce Orr T-shirts. Well, we got to do that uh, again. I mean, there it is. There's your closing argument from the president of the United States. Bruce Orr is collecting unemployment. So you won't have uh, Bruce Orr to uh, kick around anymore. Uh, let's do this one more clip of uh, Amy Coney Barrett. This was, and we will, I'm going to really try and get to this uh, Sheldon White House at the end of this. If not, maybe I'll do it tomorrow because I think it's really important. But I, I, I get the sense that she did not know one of the cases he was talking about. It's a famous precedent. And, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, she is, uh, by all accounts, a good um, law professor. Uh Funny, we don't hear that so much because that was a big problem with, with Barack Obama. But nevertheless, here she is. Uh, they were bragging about how she had no notes, no notes. Well, it looks like maybe she should have brought one note. This is when she's asked about the First Amendment. And to be fair, you know, we did it here and we could only get four as well. Now, we are not law professors. Um, what are the five freedoms of the First Amendment? Speech, religion, press, assembly, speech, press, religion, assembly. I don't know. What am I missing? Re redress or protest. Okay. Um, That's when you have the right to, you know, I guess, petition your government, get them to change uh, what they're doing in some fashion. Um, I don't know. I thought that was... Uh, it's pretty funny. I mean, obviously, we know where he's going with that. That is about religion. That is going to be the hallmark, I think, of of Amy Barrett, uh, uh, Coney Barrett's judicial career will be how many things, how many rights other people have will be abridged because of the religion of other people. Uh, but you don't need to take my word for it. We're, we're going to take a, just a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Ian Milheiser senior correspondent uh, at Vox, who writes on the Supreme Court and other legal matters. We'll be back in just a moment. We are back. Welcome to the program, or I should say, uh, returning to the program, Ian Milheiser. He is the uh, senior correspondent uh, from Vox. W what is your official title, Ian? Yeah, senior correspondent at Vox. Se All right, so senior correspondent at Vox and uh, writing on the Supreme Court. Thank you so much for joining us. I know uh, on days like this, you are in a big demand uh, and a very busy. Um, well, let's, uh, I mean, broadly speaking, and maybe it's it's not relevant on you know in terms of like what the what's what what's going to happen next. Right. But give me your sense of 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 these hearings over the past couple of days, or maybe we can even start with the premise: like, should Democrats have even attended these hearings? Right. So I mean, these hearings are normally fairly useless affairs, and this was a particularly useless hearing. Um, I think that nominees have gotten better and better at sucking all the information out of the room. And Amy Coney Barrett is a genius at that. I mean, I, I have never seen a nominee do a better job at not disclosing things than Amy Coney Barrett. Um, now that said, like, there's not a lot of mystery here. Like, like, you know, Democrats spent a lot of time trying to trick her into saying that she would overrule Roe v. Wade, and they didn't. But 
she has pledged to oppose abortion rights. And she is just she signed a statement saying that Roe v. Wade was an infamous decision. So like the mystery of how she's going to vote on Roe has kind of already been solved. You know, there's a, there was a lot of that dancing around Obamacare, trying to get her to say something about what she thinks about that. But she's already criticized the previous two decisions preserving most of the Affordable Care Act. So the hearings revealed very little. I mean, I don't know that there was any point to them at all. And, you know, I would have been just fine not having to spend the last two days of my life watching them. But there's also, you know, we also already know a great deal of useful information about this nominee. Well, I guess what I, why I'm asking is, is from as a as a political matter, because, uh, you know, we're going to get to talking about like, you know, what what your sense is as to what Democrats should do. Yeah. But as a political matter, dealing with reformation of, of the court, if if the Democrats are in a position to do it later, um, it seems to me there was they were there was a tough sell for them at the beginning, which is these hearings are a sham. Right. On a process level. I mean, it seems to me like if you're faced with a sham, what you do is you don't participate. That's how you indicate <clears throat> that it's a sham. What, what's your sense of that? So my sense of the Democrat strategy here, and this isn't so much from like, you know, talking with individual senators, but just from the outside looking in, like Democrats are winning this election right now. Like if you look at the polls, Joe Biden is more than 10 points up over Trump. And so I think that the that like the way that Democrats went into this is they were probably thinking, look, Right now, the status quo in this election favors us. We can make a big deal about Amy Coney Barrett and like maybe that helps us, but it's not in our interest to create waves like like we we, we don't want to change the conversation in the country. We don't want the voters to be paying attention to something else. We want them to keep paying attention to whatever it is they're paying attention to that gets Joe Biden to stay up by 10 points. And in the long run, I mean, Like, I mean, if we want to jump ahead a few steps, I think that Democrats are going to need to pack the Supreme Court in order to deal with the very partisan majority that it's going to have. But given the choice between Democrats winning a messaging fight right now, where they really get a lot of people angry about Amy Coney Barrett and performing really well in the elections, you know, Democrats are better off having 54 Senate seats and losing a messaging fight than they are having 52 Senate seats and winning a messaging fight. I I mean, I think that I think that's a I think that's a valid point. Let me ask you this, though. Do you think there is a sufficient um, desire, energy, willingness on the part of Democrats with those 54 uh, uh, Senate seats and I, I'm going to circle back yeah. to some of these issues that we can expect in terms of Amy Coney Barrett. But I think, you know, since we got here so quickly, we should we should we should deal with this. Do you think there is the sentiment, assuming it's 54, whatever, right. whatever the number is, uh, there is the sentiment. And maybe it just comes from Joe Biden at that point to expand the size of the court. And I guess my sense is, is that that messaging war about Amy Coney Barrett now uh, is not so much about the election that it I and, and and I think your point is is well taken that could maybe implicate the election, but is to create a sense of outrage that will carry through to that future potential future of 54 senators to create a sense of like, you need to do something about this Amy Coney Barrett thing. I mean, it's very hard to go back and say, hey, remember that thing that happened four right. months ago? That was an outrage. And yeah. we're really outraged about it now. And now we're going to have to expand the Supreme Court. I mean, if you don't set the marker contemporaneously, it's sort of hard to go back and say, hey, remember? Well, we were yeah. really outraged. We just didn't let you know about it at the time. Yeah. I mean, I think that the missing piece here and like the procedural, like, I think that Senate Democrats are very angry about Republicans, you know, saying one thing when it was Merrick Garland and then doing the other when it's Amy Coney Barrett, like pretending that there's a rule that people can't be confirmed in an election year under Obama. And then like, ha ha ha, jokes on you when it's Trump. Uh, I think there's a lot of anger. I don't think, you know, and this some of this comes from talking to Capitol Hill sources that Democrats have really coalesced around a particular solution. And I think it's hard generally to build outrage, you know, both amongst 
senators and amongst the grassroots over what's essentially a procedural objection. Like, like, I mean, there just aren't that many voters out there who are going to get outraged over, you know, they changed what they were saying about when it's appropriate to have a Supreme Court confirmation right. fight. And like, 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 that's just a hard sell. So I think the missing piece here is that there needs to be an outrage, like, a, you know, and a, and a substantive outrage. And the Supreme Court needs to strike down the Affordable Care Act. It needs to neuter the Voting Rights Act, which is something that is very much on the table this term. It needs to, you know, potentially overrule Roe v. Wade. Like, it has to do something substantive that enrages not just Senate Democrats, but Democrats in the base. And when that happens, I think there's a real chance that there's a court packing fight. The danger, I think, for Democrats is that John Roberts and Brett Kavanaugh are both very savvy political operators. I mean, you wouldn't have known it from Kavanaugh's behavior in his confirmation hearing. But well, I asked the moms and they told me. Right. But, you know, like Kavanaugh was uh, he served in a very senior role in the Bush White House. I mean, he knows how politics works. And I think there's a real danger that if Democrats do very well in the 2020 election, the Supreme Court kind of cools its heels for two years, like doesn't do anything crazy, certainly doesn't strike down the Voting Rights Act. And then if Republicans take back the Senate in 2020, then they can start doing things like manipulating our election law in ways that make it very hard for Democrats to win elections. And Democrats at that point will want to pack the court, but they won't have the votes because Republicans will control at least one House of Congress. Well, let's just talk. Let's touch on one of those things, because I I, I, I. I agree with with uh, I, I agree with the sort of like the timeline you're sort of in, and the the, the 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 sequencing of this stuff uh, on day one. I would imagine the Democrats, if they are in the majority in, in all the houses um, and, and let's for a moment assume that at one point they may have to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate on right. legislation. But I think they're going to pass a fix to Section five of the Voting Rights Act. I right. think that's is, likely if they have the votes. Yeah. And and this is this is uh, this was struck down by the court. I think it was in 2013. And it basically said there are I think it was 16 states or and uh, in, in, uh, multiple counties um, that need to check with the Department of Justice before they change their voting laws in any way, because they had a history of. Uh, of racism, essentially, when it came right. to elections, that they would disenfranchise uh, minorities. And the the Supreme Court, despite the fact that it had been reauthorized by the Senate, said racism's more or less over. This is not a fair way to do it. We don't have a problem with the concept of preclearance. We just have a problem with the way you're calculating it. Yeah. And uh, so go back and recalculate it in some way. Come up with a different algorithm, I guess, for how a state gets pre needs preclearance or or a county. And so the Democrats pass it. How long does that take? before yeah. it's challenged so yeah. that we can get one of those material sort of incidents, uh, catalysts that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, the answer is that the courts, if they want to delay a reckoning on this, have plenty of tools that they can use to do that. Um, I mean, Democrats, like if we're imagining a world where there's say 54 Democratic senators and they nuke the filibuster, Democrats have some really smart, aggressive plans on voting rights. There's the By the People Act, which really would be the most aggressive voting rights legislation ever enacted by the United States Congress. And deals with gerrymandering, deals with public financing of elections, you know, deals with things like voter ID that are just there to suppress the vote. I mean, just a really well thought out comprehensive law. There's a companion bill, H.R. 4, which is named after John Lewis, um, which is the Voting Rights Act fix. And in many ways, the Voting Rights Act fixes in H.R. 4 um, would do would make the Voting Rights Act more potent than it was before Shelby County, because it would make it easier to do what's called a bail-in. So like the way that the Voting Rights Act worked originally is that states with the history of racist voting behavior had to pre-clear new voting laws with officials in Washington, D.C. 
And there was a process where a state that had not in the past been subject to preclearance, if they did a bunch of racist stuff, could be bailed in and subjected to preclearance. Um, this law would make it much easier to bail in states. So you could see states like Wisconsin that under Scott Walker did a lot of really racist stuff um, could wind up um, potentially being subject to preclearance. And then there's statehood. So like D.C. statehood is, is, is something that Democrats have said they want to do. I think Puerto Rican statehood is, is potentially on the table. And that would help to deal with the problem of Senate malapportionment, where Republicans effectively get extra right. seats in the Senate. Um, so Democrats have a lot of big plans. I think that all of these things could potentially be struck down or at least like neutered by a Supreme Court that was sufficiently hostile to voting rights. And there's a real danger of that happening. Um, if it were to happen, I mean, with Obamacare, you know, President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act in 2010. And the first major challenge to it didn't reach the justices until 2012. Right. Um, there's but, all it, but it wasn't enacted until 2014 anyways. So, um, but I guess the, the point being that if... <clears throat> If they want to avoid a confrontation that could function as a catalyst for reform of the Supreme Court, they can do it for at least two years. Yes. And, and I mean, I think that two years would be the ordinary process for like, you know, like it, it, it wasn't like anyone dragged their feet in the Obamacare lit litigation. Right. Like, like, I mean, it just went through the normal process and it took about two years to reach the justices. If the justices want to delay things, there's lots of things they can do. Like they can say that, oh, like we don't think there's a su sufficiently developed record in this case. Let's send it down to the district court to like screw around for another six months before it comes back up like there are lots of things that the supreme court can do if its goal is to make sure that it doesn't rule until there is a republican majority in the senate okay so uh with that said that's the that's the fix scenario i guess on some level mm -hmm. uh but let's talk about the 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 highly problematic uh scenario that we are now faced with in all likelihood um by election day, it appears yeah. we're going to have a six, three majority conservative uh, court. Um, you, you and I have talked for a long time. There was I, I think um, and I'm going to try and play this clip later in the program. But Sheldon Whitehouse did a, what I thought was an amazing job of walking through the Janus um, mm -hmm. uh, saga, as he right. called it. And, and I feel like to a certain extent, frankly, that you have done that for me on a multitude of cases, including that one probably over the years. Um, and one of those is you have been talking about for a long time is a return to the Lochner era. Mm -hmm. um, what, but uh, let me let you sort of define for us, what are gonna be the implications before we even can contemplate a fix yeah. of an Amy Coney Barrett? I mean, uh, it's cause it, you know, I think people understand the hostility to Roe v. Wade and the ways in which they could start to allow more and more trap laws. These are laws that just basically put up obstacles and, yeah. and make Roe v. Wade effectively um, overturned, if not directly overturned, in practice overturned. Yeah. What are some of the other ways that it's going to affect Americans on a daily basis? Yeah, so I actually have a book coming out um, early next year that goes into this. And so realistically, I think there's four areas that we need to worry about. Um, the biggest one is voting rights. I, I mean, this is a Supreme Court that's already very hostile to the Voting Rights Act. Um, the most recent court decisions on voting rights, like there's a case out of South Carolina recently, what the court has basically signaled is that it takes a posture of indifference towards voting rights. So like, you know, Kavanaugh and Roberts, I don't think that their position has been that um, they're just going to make sure the Republicans win every in every case, no matter what. Their position has been states can do whatever the hell they want. So if California wants to have really robust voting rights, that's fine. And if South Carolina wants to put in a bunch of unnecessary obstacles for voters who are trying to cast ballots, that's fine, too. And I think that that posture, that's what we're likely to see on top of the fact that in while the Supreme Court is telling the states they can do whatever they want to do, the Supreme Court's going to make it very hard for Congress 
to pass laws like the Voting Rights Act. So it's going to make it very hard for the federal government to intervene and prevent states from 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 doing that. It's and almost that, as if they're saying there is an absence of a federal right to, to vote. Like there is no record. Like it's almost I mean, to say on the Supreme Court level, the concept it's almost as if the concept of a voting right does not exist. It only exists if a state decides to give it to you. Right. I mean, this is actually worse than that, which is that it's one thing to say that the Constitution doesn't protect a right to vote. What the Supreme Court did in cases like Shelby County and Abbott v. Perez, which which weakened much of the Voting Rights Act, is it says not only are we not going to say that the Constitution protects the right to vote here, but if the Congress, if the duly elected federal legislature enacts a law saying there shall be these protections for voting rights, we're going to strike them down. We're um, not even going to allow for a federal right to vote. Yeah, I, I exactly. And I mean, I don't know if they'll necessarily strike down every single voting rights act that you can, voting rights um, law that you can conceive of, but they've already been very aggressive. And so the biggest thing, I said there are four things I'm worried about. The biggest thing that I'm worried about is voting rights, because without voting rights, you have nothing. Right. You know, you know it, 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 you know, it, it doesn't matter. What you the you don't have the mechanism in which to deal with any of this. Yeah, so. exactly. Like without voting rights, you, you, you know, the, the laws are just going to be whatever the people in power want them to be. And you, you can't hold them accountable. So that's the first issue that worries me. Um, the second issue is the administrative state, which sounds like super technical. Um, but the issue there is a lot of laws like the Clean Air Act, for example, doesn't say here's how you have to operate a power plant. It says we want to make sure that power plants use the best available technology, taking into account factors like cost in order to reduce admission, uh, emissions. And we know that over time there's going to be better technology. And so, like, we're going to want to change what you have to use over time is better technology emerges. And so it's the job of the EPA to study what sort of technology is out there and to update the rules that power plants have to have to follow as new technology emerges. And there's, there's just a lot of laws that work this and way. This is, this is the concept of delegation. I, exactly. And so there's this thing called the non-delegation doctrine that like Gorsuch in particular is particularly jazzed up about. And there are already five votes, it appears, to revive the non-delegation doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine, in effect, gives the Supreme Court a veto over any federal regulation. So, like, the Supreme Court doesn't like what, Cong what the EPA has done with power plants, the Supreme Court can veto it. The Supreme Court doesn't like that the Department of Health and Human Services have said that health plans have to cover birth control. And this came up recently in the Little Sisters case. The Supreme Court can veto it. You know, the, you know whatever, you know, whatever, you know, the, the Supreme Court doesn't like that the Obama administration wants to make sure that more people are paid overtime. Supreme Court can veto it. So, and just to be clear, once the Supreme Court says that and, and, and this sort of dovetails with the Chevron deference, which is where the, the court, you know, uh, defers to the expertise of these agencies in handling these type of issues. But once the court says that we um, we have this non-delegation doctrine, the Supreme Court, that sends the messages to the federal circuit courts. Right. Right some of which are significantly more conservative than others, depending on the region right. uh, very often. And they can start to strike down these laws. Exactly. And, and because they are doing so under the umbrella of this non-delegation principle that the Supreme Court has established. So it's basically open season where anything from like cafe standards on cars to requirements for chicken processing plants, for uh, I mean, drug safety. I mean, all, yeah. the, the OSHA list is, standards, workplace safety. Yeah, I mean, everything every, is yeah. on the table at that point, and up to the whims of some of the most conservative justices. And we should remind people, two hundred and some odd. I think we're at fifteen now of those judges appointed during the Trump era. Right. Yeah. Like basically, what we're talking about is a huge transfer of power from the president and the executive branch to the judicial branch. 
And like, I mean, obviously I'm not too jazzed about the president we have right now, but one thing that I like about the president is you can vote them out of office. Right. And, you know, so the Supreme Court has already been pretty clear, even before Barrett, that it wants to bring back this non-delegation doctrine. The reason why Barrett matters is because the more conservative the court gets, the more often it's going to use its veto power. Like there may be some regulations that John Roberts would say, you know, like, that's fine. Like, I will let this rule saying that you have to have some like protection in meat packing plants that prevents people from getting their fingers cut off still survive. And if Roberts is no longer the swing vote, like maybe you won't have that anymore. Right. So that's the second thing, administrative law. Um, third thing is religion. And in the religion space, like the big issue is basically whether people who have a religious objection to following a particular law are allowed to just ignore that law. Um, you know, the most common example, like the big fight right now, and there's a case in front of the Supreme Court that will be heard next month dealing with this, um, is whether people with religious objections to gay people or to trans people are allowed to discriminate against them, even when the law says that that discrimination is illegal. Um, but like these lawsuits aren't going to stop with LGBT people. Like, you, you know, I think the Supreme Court is likely to say that there is a constitutional right for religious people to discriminate against LGBT people. And like someone's going to come along and say, well, you know, I believe in the so-called Billy Graham rule, you know, the Pence rule that I shouldn't be alone um, with a woman who's not my wife. And so the fact that I give all these job opportunities to my male employees because they get to meet with me. And I don't give it to my female employees because they never get any FaceTime with me because of my religion. Like, you can't enforce the ban on gender discrimination against me. You know, you could potentially see suits, although, like, at least some justices have, have signaled that, like, they think race discrimination goes too far. But, like, you could potentially see something like the... Um, the Bob Jones University case being right. reopened, which was the case where a university claimed that it had a religious right to forbid its white students from dating its black students. And we should say that that case we've talked about in the past, not in the context of its legal implications, but that was considered to be the seminal moment where the religious right in this country started to organize with the Republican Party. They couldn't get people on board for that. That had to do with Jimmy Carter and the taxation yep. of, of that school uh, subject to, to a tax exemption. Um, and they ended up uh, deciding on abortion as the issue that could motivate um, their, uh, their, their voters who up until that point were, were sort of more of the attitude, leave unto Caesar, you know, yep. Caesar's realm, as it were. But this, and, and I mean, frankly, I mean, it doesn't seem it, it doesn't seem terribly inconsistent. Like uh, I'm uh, my, my religion feels that you shouldn't um, uh, intermarry between races. And so therefore, I'm not going to rent my um, any of my apartments in my building that I own as a religious person to any mixed race couple. I just don't think it's what God wanted. I mean, theoretically. Right. That's what it opens the door to. Right. I mean, if you I don't know what the limiting principle is at that point. Yeah, I mean, the limiting principle is like whatever the justices th like if the justices think that the law is sufficiently important that religious people should have to follow it, then they'll have to follow it. And if the justices like just don't think it's important. I mean, if you, if you go back and look at some of the older cases, there was an older case that said that it doesn't matter that you have a religious objection to Social Security taxes. You still have to pay them. I mean, potentially that could be reversed. There was a case. Um, involving people uh, people who said they had a religious objection to paying their workers the minimum wage and the supreme court said you have to pay them the minimum wage i mean potentially that could be reversed i've told that for everybody working here that uh, my god says when well, i'm not supposed to do that but yeah yeah i, I mean like advise. yeah i mean so you know if in fact you, you know people gain exemptions to the law i mean like conceivably like you know I get a speeding ticket or like I run a red light and I say to the cop, well, I'm late to church. And like my religion tells me I can't be late to church. So you can't give me a ticket. Like, does that mean that I'm immune to speeding laws? I mean, the answer is we don't know. It depends right. whether the, what, whatever it's, whatever the Supreme court says. Okay. And that's, and that's the third one. What's the fourth. Then the fourth is the question of who is allowed to enforce their rights in the first place. 
And this is an area where the Supreme Court has already been very aggressive. The, the biggest place where you see this is what's called forced arbitration cases. Um, so this is when like, you know, you get you, you, you're doing your job and like, um, you know, and everything seems cool. And then all of a sudden you get an email from your boss that says, as of this moment, you are bound by a forced arbitration clause. If you ever have a, a lawsuit against the company, you're not allowed to go to a real court. You have to go to a privatized arbitration system. You're forbidden from bringing a class action suit. And if you don't like it, you're fired. So this, this is something the Supreme Court has, has already said is allowed. And so what happens is, I mean, we have data on this. In the employment context, um, employees are much less likely to win in front of an, arbitra an arbitrator. And when they do win, they receive a whole lot less money. Right. So this just gives companies, you know, all of a sudden, like, you know, let's say that, you know, you believe that you were fired because you are black. You know, if you go to a real court, you have a good chance of winning and your lawyer tells you, you know, you could maybe collect $100,000. If you go to an arbitrator, you have a much smaller chance of winning and your lawyer says, you know, well, if you win, you're probably going to get $20,000. First of all, you're not going to get a very good, you may not get a very good lawyer under those circumstances because a lot of lawyers work on a contingency basis where they get a percentage of the winnings. But even if, you know, you don't have that problem, you know, you're going to start thinking like, you know, this is a huge hassle. And yeah. like, do I want to get a reputation when I'm applying for my next job as the person who sued my previous employer? If the amount of money on the table is only 20,000 and not 100,000. So like these sorts of things can affect effectively strip people of their ability to enforce their rights. It's, it's the creation of an entirely parallel judicial system that is privatized yes. and works with the same privatized incentive as anything else. I mean, the arbiter, uh, arbitrators, they know that that one guy you're talking about, he's not going to show up very often and he's not the one who's going to be paying their right. bills. They, he knows that the company, the major corporation, they're going to be paying our bills. So we want to be the arbitration for them. I mean, right. that's, I mean, there's so many problems with that, the access to our judicial system. And then, of course, it also changes the behavior of the corporations if they know that there is a disincentive for anybody that they have wronged in that way to come um, and uh, try and uh, get money from them in the future, then their behavior is going to reflect that 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 lack of, I guess, a threat to them. Right. So, yeah. So in like the real court system, there are all sorts of rules dealing with what are called personal jurisdiction and venue, which are essentially the rules governing which court you're allowed to sue in if you have a dispute. And they aren't airtight. Like there's a lot of what is called forum shopping, where like lawyers will shop around for judges that they think will be favorable to their client. But there's limits to forum shopping. Like, you know, it, you know, Vox Media, my employer is a D.C. based company. And if I have a grievance against them, you, you know, I could probably file in D.C. because that's where they're based. Like right now, I, I live in northern Virginia and I work. I'm doing a lot of work in Virginia. I could probably sue in a Virginia court. But if I was like, hey, there's this judge out in Nebraska who I think is going to rule in my favor, I'd have a real tough time making an argument that I can go to Nebraska. But in the arbitration system, Typically, when you get this forced arbitration contract, it doesn't just say, you know, you're stuck in arbitration, you can't bring a class action and so on and so forth. It names the company that will perform the arbitration. And so, you know, the company is going to know the, 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 the corporation that writes that contract is going to know more about those companies than the plaintiffs are. Right. It's going to get to pick them. And then, like you said, the arbitrators know. I mean, big employers are sued all the time. So they are repeat players. Individuals, you know, I've never been a party to a lawsuit in my life. Most people haven't. And so if you're the arbitration company, you know, what's got to be going on in the back of your mind is like, you know, if, if, if I do a solid for this employee they're never going to see me again. If I do a solid for this corporation, they're going to continue to pay my bills. Right, right, right. I mean, it's obvious. I mean, it's sort of the same problem we had with the, with the rating agencies. So, um, and, and I mean, this is going to happen 
we're going to start to see this change. I mean, but the problem is it's a little bit opaque, right? I mean, but, but it, for, for your average person, we're going to start to see this change two weeks from now or whatever. I mean, with the 6-3 uh, court, aren't we? I mean, we, we won't know that the, that something has changed right away because it takes a while for cases to perc- percolate. But yeah, I mean, this is going to, I mean, absent court packing, you know, absent Democrats doing something to change the makeup of the Supreme Court, this is going to be locked in for a really long time. And, you, you, you know, with a six to three majority, you know, we're basically relying on Brett Kavanaugh. To be the per- to, to, to to be the voice of reason, like like you know, for two years, John Roberts has been the guy who, like, every now and then looked at what his Republican colleagues wanted to do. Was like, hey guys, that that's a bit too much, and like the next most moderate justice is Brett Kavanaugh, and like just stop and think about that for a second. I I mean, if you, if if you want to know where the difference between Brett Kavanaugh and the other justices in the South Carolina case that I brought up, that's the witness. You need a witness for uh, signing the ballots, which of course in North Carolina, they've just imposed that probably based upon that, that ruling that happened in South Carolina. Yeah. So they, there's, you know, in South Carolina, there's this requirement that you have to get a witness to sign your absentee ballot, which ordinarily isn't a big deal, but in a pandemic, I mean, right. there are people who may not want, you know, be able to talk to their neighbors. Um, so what happened in that case, the Supreme Court reinstated the witness requirement. Kavanaugh's opinion basically said, we're completely indifferent to voting rights. States go do what you want. Um, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch said not only would they reinstate the witness requirements, but they would also toss out all the ballots that had already been cast by people who didn't get a witness during the period when there was a court order in place saying they didn't need a witness. Wow. So like the difference between, say, a Gorsuch and a Kavanaugh is Kavanaugh says, I don't care about your rights. And Gorsuch says, I'm going to burn your rights to the ground. Ian Melheiser, uh, senior correspondent for Vox, always really um, uh, it brightens my day. I, I am from- here to bring uplift and joy, lollipops and love, unicorns and happiness. I cannot uh, wait for your book, uh, and I hope to speak to you at least uh, before it comes out, and certainly then. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a, a quick break, and then we'll come back, and I want to play that um, – that Sheldon Whitehouse uh, clip for you. Quick break. We are back. Um, so I've been talking about this clip. I, I think Sheldon White, Whitehouse did a great job on this. And uh, since uh, in for a penny, in for a pound, uh, we are going to hear, uh, obviously, tonight uh, from both candidates. Um, ABC News uh, is uh, NBC News head Cesar Conde says we share in the frustration that our event will initially air alongside the first half of ABC's broadcast with Vice President Biden. Our decision is motivated only by fairness, not business considerations. I'm not sure I understand that concept. Uh, it's the American public who are going to lose out here. Uh, but um, let's, uh, we got time for this clip. All right, so let, cue up this clip, Brendan. I'm going to talk over it a little bit, and maybe we can cut back to me. This is Sheldon Whitehouse. He has just had this exchange where he is explaining to Amy Coney Barrett, who apparently did not know this. The Supreme Court, there is no code of ethics for the Supreme Court. There is no statutory code of ethics. There are for lower courts. There are for members of Congress. There are members uh, for members of the administration. Statutory obligations to reveal and be transparent about who's paying you for certain things, uh, what you can and cannot do, how you must recuse yourself. That does not exist for the highest court in the land. And after talking about that, Sheldon Whitehouse, and suggesting that maybe he and Lindsey Graham will offer legislation to that effect, he goes into this. And this is very important. It's a little bit long. I'm going to break it up and explain to you what's going on. But this is very important for you to understand how these cases are going to make it to the Supreme Court now and what's going to happen to so many of the things that we take for granted in our material lives. 
You've got that potentially coming uh, your way. So I flag that for you. Uh, the second thing, another topic I'd like to raise with you is um, you've repeatedly mentioned during this hearing the phrase about um, litigation winding its way up uh, through the courts and ultimately to the Supreme Court. And you've described that process of winding its way as an important restraint on judicial activism. That you've got to wait till a court gets a case gets to you in the ordinary course, correct? Correct. That's a fair description of where you've been? Correct. Yeah. And the. Oh, what happened? I know we're going a little fast. It's fine. We can, keep it, uh, we can keep it sped up. That's fine. A person, right? Correct. And that person feels an injury? Yes. And then that person goes to a lawyer? Yes. And then that lawyer goes on their behalf to court? And files a complaint. And files a complaint. All right, guys, I'm not seeing any picture. So in court, pause it. They try to speed, speed it reshare. back up. You can speed it back up, but I'm not seeing any picture. Oh, shit. One, one second. Come on. Hang in there with us, uh, folks. Just a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. I mean, this is... Um, he, uh, uh, Senator Whitehouse is, is basically saying that she has said, you know, this concept of, of, a, of a case winding its way through court, that, you know, someone's wronged, they go to court, it works its way up through the district court, and then the circuit court, and it's appealed, and then maybe it makes it to the Supreme Court. It, it makes it seem like it's happenstance. And Whitehouse is making the argument here that this is not only is it not happenstance, there are concerted efforts to bring about uh, cases. And not only are there concerted efforts to bring about cases, there is a communication between the justices where they are hunting for cases so that they can attack certain doctrines that have existed in our law, in some instances, for decades. Do we have it, Brandon? Yes. Okay, let's play it. You can speed it up a little bit, it's fine. To a lawyer? Yes. And then that lawyer goes on their behalf to court? And files a complaint. And files a complaint. And then in court, they try to win and vindicate their injury. That's kind of the basic standard way in which this works. Yes. So it gets a little weird sometimes. And that's a circumstance I'd like to bring up to you because it touches on some of the stuff that I addressed yesterday. Um, one case, let me, it's not even a case. Let me call, you know Janice. Yes. Okay. Let's describe this as the Janus saga, because it's more than really one case. And it's really about a completely different case called Aboud. You're familiar with the Aboud decision? Yes. So the Aboud decision was precedent for, what, 40 years? Uh, I can't remember when Aboud was decided, but Pause it was precedent it for one before second. Janus. Yeah. And roughly I'm going to try and go quick here. We don't have too much time. The idea that she doesn't know exactly how long is very, very odd to me. She may not know about the Abood case. It was from 1977. It was Abood v. Detroit. It basically said that public sector workers, that a, a union shop, public sector workers can work in a union shop, and even if you're not a member of the union, you still need to pay union agency fees so that, th that you're paying for them to represent all the workers because they got to pay for lawyers and they do all the negotiating on your behalf. That is Abood. 1977, very famous case. If you, if you tapped me on the shoulder and said, when was a boot? I would have said it was probably in the 70s, but she seems not to know that. 40 years, I'll tell you. Um, and had repeatedly been reaffirmed. It was a longstanding precedent. Yeah, on which there was considerable reliance. Um, let's see. So Janice did overrule that precedent, and so Janice did go through the application of the stare decisis factors in deciding whether to overrule it, right. whether that... And there, had, there was, in fact, reliance in the 40 years that it had been the law of the land on the question of the, the union question um, that it had resolved. Um, well, I don't want to second guess I don't or think criticize she knows what or Abood is. praise the majority so, in Janice's Of course there was I'm reliance. You, I'm asking you as Unions a matter of fact, had 20 plus states for 40 years based um, upon this. Well, Senator, I think reliance and the degree of reliance on Abood okay. is a legal question. We'll just leave that then. So uh, the, uh, the Janice saga question. begins actually with a case called Knox, in which um, Justice Alito... Um, took a shot at Aboud. Um, he criticized it as substantially impinging upon First Amendment rights of union members. Just to, for people who are watching, the Aboud case was about the right of a labor union to get compensated, not dues, but just compensation, from non-members when in their representation of their members they get added benefits for the people who are not members. So not the most exciting part of the law, but 
settled this question of when labor unions could get compensated for work they do for non-members. But Justice Alito did not like it. He took a shot at it in Knox versus SEIU, and the um, concurrence in that case said, whoa, wait a minute. Quote, the majority's choice to reach an issue not presented by the parties, briefed or argued, disregards our rules. Pause it for one Alito second. Like something about the point is, something. Knox was about union dues, not agency fees. And to bring in agency fees in the context of a legal case, you are really, you're really stretching. Like this, this is not at issue here. The Supreme Court always deals with stuff that is very narrowly tailored. And to bring this other stuff, set off an alarm bell with the people, uh, with the, the other Supreme Court justices. Why would you bring this up? That's an odd. I mean, it's it's tangentially related, but it has nothing to do with the disposition of this case. Continue. So he took that shot. Then we went on to a later decision called Harris v. Quinn. Alito took another shot at Abood in that case, describing Abood as having analysis that is questionable. He undertook an extended critique of the decision describing it as having questionable foundations. Justice Kagan spotted that, and in her dissent, she said, today's majority cannot resist taking pot shots at Abood, uh, and described its critique of Abood's foundations as gratuitous dicta. But the message went out from Judge Alito that he wanted to do something about Abood. There was something about Abood that he did not like. And with that, we went to, that's the prequel. Then we went to the two cases that followed. Um, the first one was Friedrichs, which was supposed to be the case that got rid of Abood. And it had an interesting travel um, because the lawyer in the case was one of these groups from Janus. It was the Center for Individual Rights right here who was counsel. In Janus, the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation was counsel. So they switched, right? In Friedrichs, Center for Individual Rights was counsel. Counsel, National Right to Work, was an amicus. When it went on to Janus, they switched. National Right to Work Legal Foundation, Defense Foundation was uh, counsel and Center for Individual Rights was an amicus. Um, and from everything that I see, it looks like they actually went out and found the plaintiff. So back to our earlier discussion, it wasn't the injured person that went and hired a lawyer. It was the legal group that went and found a plaintiff. Um, and then they went to court, which everybody does. But it got interesting there because uh, there the lawyers asked to lose. I don't know if you've ever been a case in which the lawyers asked to lose before. I never have been. I've never litig litigated against anybody who asked to lose. Have you ever been in a case in which a party asked to lose? Um, no, I don't think I've ever experienced that. Yeah, I can, ima <laughs> I can imagine not. Um, so these groups with all this money behind them from Donors Trust and Bradley okay, Foundation. Let's cut out of this uh, liberal because we've got to wrap court, things up here. And they say, but the please, bottom line is White House has now shown how Alito called through sort of bringing in another element for cases to come up through the system so that he could attack the right of unions to get paid for their representation of everybody in a shop. And White House is also listing how the all of the people representing the plaintiffs in this, all the entities were basically the same entities. They were getting money from the same places. They would put a different name on who was going to actually litigate the case and who was just going to write an amici brief, which is, or uh, amicus brief, which is basically just a legal work that is put into the argument, sort of basically deputies, if you will, that ostensibly come from outside who might have a, a thing to say about a case. But in this instance, they didn't really come from outside because they're getting funded by the same people. And White House is basically, I don't know if he's doing it just uh, for our benefit. Perhaps it could be in part for Amy Coney Barrett's uh, benefit. But he is basically explaining something that is deeply, deeply corrupt in our system now. Money. And uh, uh, not only this mass amount of money that is going to, on one hand, spending tens of millions of dollars to make sure that Kavanaugh gets on the court, tens of million dollars that make sure that Amy Coney Barrett gets on the court, money that you cannot determine where it's from. Then also starts to feed up cases to these justices. And today in the hearing, uh, White House said he is going to, to dig deeper into this. So keep your eyes open for that. All right.
we got to take a uh, break. Say goodbye uh, to uh, many of you folks. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for joining us. If you're sticking around, we got the uh, fun half. The uh, entire crew is going to, to be here. I'm going to step out. But uh, Matt and Brendan and Jamie and uh, old Matt will be here um, steering the ship. Just a reminder, you can support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you support the free show. You also um, help. Um, well, you also get the extra content. And what else? Uh, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea or chocolate. Use the coupon code majority, get 10% off. Uh, what else do we have for you? Oh, AM Quickie. It's available in your inbox. Well, not in your inbox. Maybe we could do it that way where we could email it to people. But uh, you can find it in the app at majorityapp.com, completely free, or you can just sign up for it through your other uh, podcast app. Check it out. Seven minutes of headline news every morning. We will be back uh, tomorrow. Make sure you check out uh, Nomiki's show. Nomiki's show on youtube.com slash the Nomiki show. Um, I don't know who's going to be on today, but uh, 3 p.m. You can check that out. Also, uh, don't forget, uh, Jamie's got the Antifada. You can find it at uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. TMBS, Matt, and uh, check out uh, Matt Bender's show, Doomed. Stick around. We're going to go to the uh, fun half, and you can um, join these guys there. Should we head in there? Here we go. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly.
Well, hello, everybody. Or, or should I say, uh, good morning, Sunday morning. <laughs> what? Uh, you don't remember Nancy Pelosi uh, the other, what was it, like a week or two ago on that I try, Sunday show? I try to forget. Uh, well, I, I remember every single TV appearance that Nancy Pelosi does. It's just ingrained in my head. Yeah, well. I replay them all day, every day. You would. You take pictures of the TV, you print them yeah. out, you put them on your wall. I know. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's that's I'm surrounded by Nancy Pelosi over here. You just don't know because there's a green screen up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You pull up that green screen. There's a big old collage tribute to your Khaleesi. That's true. That's true. Uh, so what's up, everyone? I guess we should do like a real intro because Sam didn't like, you know, have us on in that first half because I guess he had to run. Uh, it's Matt Binder. And this is Jamie. How you doing, Jamie? I'm all right. Uh, and where's Matt Leck? There he I'm, is. You can see me, I think, right now. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hi, hi, Brendan. Hey, Matt. How are you? Good, good. All right, guys. We let's, got the let's whole news buddy squad here. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> so excited. News buddies sounds like a uh, like community access sort of like cartoon for kids. Uh, to, I mean, maybe that's what we are. We're like, hey, the kids doing the news i like that i don't know it could also it also feels like a, an adult swim like 10 minute type thing they have on really late at night the so news jaded. buddies <laughs> yeah that's what so, uh that's what cole's son calls us on ghetto news network so i'm uh applying it to this because i think it applies i All like right. it. i like that news buddies uh so guys what would you like to talk about first today Oh, where do we even begin? There's so much horrible news out there. Oh, well, there's some there's some good news. Well, it, it, good news, depending on, I guess. I mean, I think it's good news because I don't think just because, you know, I think, you know, platforms do have some sense of responsibility to not let uh, harmful misinformation and conspiracy theories fly all around. But uh, YouTube has uh, followed in the steps of Facebook now, and they are now upping their... Uh, their actions against QAnon content. This just was announced this morning and they've already taken down some of the largest QAnon centric channels on its platform. These are, these are channels that literally have been, uh, you know, th they've taken credit and been given credit by people who say that, you know, their family members lost their job during the pandemic, had all this time, fell onto these specific channels on YouTube uh, while they were home and, and without work and had nothing to do. And now their minds have been basically uh, stolen from, from reality by these QAnon channels. And they now believe in, you know, JFK Jr. being alive and Donald Trump fighting all the evil in the world, like the global satanic pedophile rings run by uh, the Democrats and how the Hollywood elite are eating babies in order to rejuvenate their skin and their youth and their bodies. And so it's a good thing, I think, that a lot of these channels will no longer be able to spew uh, this shit. The, the addendum is that YouTube is banning uh, the content and the channels that do this if they target harmful, if they're, if they're harmful conspiracy theories, target specific individuals or groups. So they can still generally say there's a global pedophile ring uh, out there uh, under the QAnon banner, but they can't come out and say, uh, you know, Tom Hanks is a pedophile. That would be considered mm. banned under YouTube's new rules. I see. So harmless conspiracy theories are still allowed to persist. So this yes. seems, this seems and less about... Um, you know, like the cultural damage that these massive propaganda machines are doing and more about uh, limiting their liability for things like libel and slander. I mean, sort of, I, don't know. I, guess, you... I mean, I mean, they're sort of already protected from that, you know, section 230. Uh, but, you know, I, I think they just don't want the press of one of these channels uh, directly inspiring the next mass murderer who believes that the people they killed were secretly running a pedophile ring in the basement of uh, MGM Studios in Hollywood or something like that. You know what I mean? I think that's more the case. Yeah, that seems uh, reasonable enough to me. Um, Twitter is also taking steps to restrict the flow of uh, fake news. Am I right? Yeah, I saw this people this, getting this, upset about it last night. Some libertarian types were like, "Oh no," which is kind of ironic, right? Because you are the ones who wanted the private sector to become more powerful than the state, 
right? You are the ones who wanted private companies to control the flow of information. And guess what? Private companies aren't subject to the same First Amendment regulations as the state is. So don't get upset when private companies decide, oh, shit, this is bad for our image to be spreading crazy lies around. We'd better do something about it. All right. I, would I, mean, also, I, go ahead. I, I, I agree. And I think the Twitter one's a little bit more complicated because they they botched the, 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 their response to it. Like they botched their explanation as to why they were doing this. You know, usually it's very simple. They take down the hour and a half long pandemic video that's claiming that the coronavirus was set up by, you know, the Democrats or China. And, you know, and that's obviously a conspiracy theory that has no basis in reality. There's nothing there. It could be debunked by professionals and journalists and medical experts right off the bat. Whereas this one with the New York Post, I think they jumped, personally, I think they jumped the gun a little bit. I think they should have waited for those fact checkers to do it first before they right. decided that they weren't going to do anything process, with it. Let the processes you've committed yourself to play out and let Biden deny that he had the meeting. And that's the way these things go. Instead, you turn it into this collusion with the tech things, which is exactly what Josh Holly would have want. And then, you know, I, I think Jamie's point about the public perception of this is right. There's also the perception, there's also the motivation of uh, they expect to get regulated actually. And so during this whole administration and it bugs me when leftists don't point this out and only jump on this, like, Oh, look at them helping Democrats, right? This entire administration, uh, Facebook has been tweaking their system to be a little bit easy on Republicans because there's so many lies coming out from that side of the aisle that they literally can't, like do anything about it that wouldn't hurt the candidates themselves. So, right. Like they, they've had their finger on the scales for a lot of the time on behalf of the current administration and power structure in charge, because they, they don't want to go in front of Holly and Kavanaugh and they don't like, right. I, I assume there's like, they're afraid of being regulated. And now that it looks like Biden is going to beat Trump. I mean, I, I think that's the part where it's like, do they, are they really as protected as they feel or are they responding as if they are being regulated and just pretending they're not? Because I think right. that's a kind of ambiguous situation that isn't helpful for free speech at all. I, mean, I think that's a great point. I think that's exactly what's going on. Obviously, uh, I think in more, more in the forefront, like just for what they want to show is that they're doing this stuff. So the you know, so they can get rid of the bad press so they get, but when it comes down to it, what does the bad press lead to? Like, they don't just care that, you know, the New York Times is talking, you know, crap about them. They care about actually something coming from that. And like you said, that's what they're looking towards right now, that there's going to be some sort of regulatory uh, uh, body that, that looks at them and, and throws new rules their way, new regulations their way. Uh, that's a great point. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I think the slippery slope thing is obviously a concern, but I think that's just more like, you know, do we want to have, do, do we want to be steeped in our own ideals? Like personally, like, I don't think the slippery slope thing is if we do this to the right, oh no, they're going to do this to the left next. We've already seen these companies don't care about that. I mean, it's not like if we fought for Alex Jones not to be banned from, uh, from uh, YouTube, it's not like YouTube would have been like, okay, we're going to be uh, more open to, uh, you know, any sort of uh, leftist things that we decide are, you know, there's no effect on it. It, it really, in fact, if anything, uh, we need to put the pressure on the way this, the right is doing and, and force their hand like the right's doing. The right, like you said, too, has free reign pretty much uh, to do so much, especially in terms of who's spreading the misinformation. Like these companies have basically come out and said, yeah, we have a bunch of policies that affect pretty much everyone, but politicians and especially uh, Mr. Donald Trump, numero uno right there. Like they have policies that basically carve out exceptions for him. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's time for these companies to act like they're media companies, right? Because uh, I don't know if people even realize this, but part of the reason why, you know, the fourth estate, the written word, the media biz is dying is because all of the ad money is going to Facebook and Google and lots and lots of people, uh, crazy high percentage. I used to work in this field. So I, I had the statistics at some point and I'm sure it's gotten worse since then. Cause that was a few years ago. Most people get their news from Facebook 
looking at their feed and clicking on stuff. And sometimes um, you click a link and you're still re- what you're the story you're reading. It's still on Facebook. It's hosted on Facebook, but they have some kind of deal where the media company still gets to count it as a click. But like they probably have to pay Facebook in some like ransomy scenario. So it is a cop out for these companies to say we're just new neutral platforms when they are controlling the flow of information much in the way that the media used to do. Right, right. And, and like, YouTube, I don't think they're doing it for the good of society, like we oh, were just okay. talking about. I think they're obviously doing it for themselves, but any any kind, like, I don't think we have to apply the same principles equally to the right and the left, because they don't do it for us. Absolutely not. So anything that helps beat back the threat of the far right, I'm fine with. Right. Yeah, I mean, and, and you, I... I personally would operate a social network that wasn't able to editorialize uh, and make that exact point that I don't consider like the right and the left to be equally threatening to, you know, a good social network. And I would be honest and open about that. And when I made interventions, I wouldn't hide behind like, oh, we got to get to the fact checkers. And oh, actually, if you look at this part of our terms of service, actually, that's what we meant. Like, you need to, I, I, there's a lot of dishonesty here and that's because they need to be a little bit dishonest to keep the whole thing mm-hmm. afloat. I feel like, uh, yeah, but right. yeah, it shouldn't just also, be about the Pinocchios. It should be about what is right for the world, but uh, you know, they're never going to do that. Right. I mean, the idea that, you know, Facebook or any of these companies could just sit back and let it flow. Like it'd be great if there was actually this platform, this neutral platform and just let anyone say whatever they want and nothing was, you know, upvoted, downvoted, nothing could be gamed. But the fact is all this stuff could be gamed. So they all play a part. Like just, just the algorithm that any of these companies have, you brought up Facebook. So let's take Facebook, the Facebook algorithm puts a, uh, uh, promotes and uh, basically pushes up in news feeds content that gets the most engagement because they want people to spend more time on Facebook. So if the algorithm sees content that really gets people wrapped into staying on Facebook and reading the content, co- uh, uh, sharing the content, commenting on the content, they'll say, ooh, this is some good content for us. Let's push it in people's news feeds. You know, if they're following this person, doesn't matter if this story is uh, eight hours old, we're going to show it to the top of their news feed because that's what's getting the engagement. Like that's, that's, that's the point here. Like, like none of this stuff is natural. None of this stuff is just getting shared because it's the talk of the town. It's getting shared because it's getting promoted by these algorithms that again are created by real people who have a, a profit motive. That's right. Totally. And, and if you look at the, because uh, there are sort of analogous conspiracy mindsets floating around on the left, right? But like, I think Matt Crispin pointed this out on History is a Weapon. If you look at the the ways that things are engineered to be clickable and the, the centers that they impact in people's brains, uh, there is no contest between QAnon and like, you know, more fantastical versions of Russia Gate, right? One is obviously more appealing to people's ids for obvious reasons. Right. I mean, one's one's a story that's still being like one's a story that you could argue with when it was going on. It was still being unraveled. There was sources that were like legitimate sources that were adding to the legitimacy of certain claims. Like there is no legitimacy on open conspiracy theories. There's no research being done. Like people, people say, oh, I'm doing the research. What they're basically doing is they're being thrown around to different conspiratorial sources and thinking that's research. Like that's not research. You're not calling uh, people who were there or people who are experts on the matter. You're not doing any research yourself. You're just reading things that random people are posting online and you think you're doing some sort of extra work. You're not. Yeah. Well, we've spoken about this in reference to the difference between the parapolitical and conspiracy theories, right? Because there are things that the government hasn't told us, right? That exist in the realm of the parapolitical, by which I mean, it's not confirmed fact, but you know, something fishy's going on, right? Like, I don't know, the JFK assassination, but the difference between the parapolitical and a conspiracy theory is in the parapolitical you work with the information that you have and come to a conclusion from that conspiracy theories you start with a conclusion (laughs) and work your way backwards and every new piece of information you get fits into your overarching worldview right but in conspiracy in conspiracy in the harmful in in the most like like the dumbest of the conspiracy theories the conclusion's even wrong like 
for example, like you mentioned, like, you know, there's some conspiracies that are, are legitimate. Like, for you know, I can't say there's no such thing as aliens. We don't know that. In fact, based on what we know about the universe and galaxies, there's very likely there are aliens out there, much more likely than us being the only thing, the only, you know, living thing uh, on, you know, in the, in the, the uh, you know, universe. But so that's still an open thing. You could speculate. You could continue to wonder about that. We'll, we won't know till we get to that conclusion. But with for Pizzagate, for example, the conclusion was there's a child pedophile ring happening, uh, uh, occurring under in the basement of a Comet Pizzeria in D.C. Uh, there is no basement Comet Pizzeria in D.C. Like right away, the, the hypothesis is wrong. There's no you, you can't go anywhere from that. It's done. It's over. You're wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're both sort of communal activities. I think one distinction, and I think, Jamie, you bring this up about the powerlessness of conspiracy theories, a distinction to be made between QAnon and the, uh, you know, the worst instances of Russiagate, which is that, you know, I'd argue that more lives are being ruined by QAnon, just in terms of like people being just, you know, propagandized into like this little weird bubble. The problem with Russiagate is it's sort of a, it's not, it's not remote from power, right? Like that's actually everybody engaging in a sort of mythology of what power was doing at the moment. Um, and so like, so for instance, like I'm listening to Michael Hayden on CNN. I'm like, Michael Hayden and me are on the same team, right? Like, which is, I, which I understand why people criticize that aspect of Russiagate because that is horrible too. But I also think like, collapsing those down i just think the amount of human misery and like just familial strife caused by this QAnon stuff oh, yeah and that these that these that these social networks have been really like pumping into people's brains it's really depressing yeah it's awful and like here's yet one more instance where you're like oh well people can think for themselves like it's okay that there's all that fake stuff out there because people should be able to evaluate it no actually they can't and it is engineered very specifically to override their rational impulses and their, uh, you know, their, 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 their intellect, their serious inquiry, like, um, normal people, people with like, I mean, backing it up. Sean was talking on our show, uh, this week actually about how he has an uncle and I know this guy, he's a really nice guy. He's always been like, kind of got conservative inclinations. You know, they, they live on Long Island. There's a little bit of right wing populism around there, but he was, he always seemed like a reasonable person to me. And now he's like gone down this Facebook rabbit hole and he believes in the QAnon shit. And he's got, he bought a bunch of guns. It's like legit scary. It's like, who are you? You've been taken over by pod people. You'd be surprised at how many people that maybe not full on QAnon, but I mean, Bender knows this maybe better than I do, but there's a lot of layers to QAnon and it's like yeah. you can get in to like something and not even really know it's QAnon until like, like remember that like Wayfair conspiracy theory, right? That got a whole bunch of people on. And like right. when I saw that, I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't make the instant connection to QAnon. I mean, I, you do, you have the same sense of like, this is a, hyster a bit of a hysterical reaction on the part of social media, but then QAnon just snatched that right up. And right. I mean, the, 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 the people, people who are like Q curious, like who are learning about it, they're like, yeah, you know, of course, pedophilia is bad. We all agree. Chil we love children. We have to protect them. Pedophiles are terrible people and, and pedophilia is horrible. Yeah, people agree with that. But that's not the point of QAnon. That's how they suck you in. That's what they're using to appeal to your emotions and to what, you know, that's the universal thing they try to pull you into. Yeah, we all agree pedophilia is bad, but that's not what they're pushing. In fact, th some of the most prominent QAnon faces, some of the people who are the biggest promoters with the most reach, the, the people with the, well, probably we don't have YouTube channels anymore, but people with the biggest YouTube channel subscriber count and the biggest followers on Facebook or, or Twitter, these guys, some of these guys, and I'll, I'll stress some because not all, each one of them has their own, but a good portion of them have openly said and admitted that, yeah, it's likely that Donald Trump has taken part in, you know, having sex with children. But to be fair, he's trying to take this ring down like with Epstein. So he had to do this stuff to go undercover. It's for the greater good. They've literally admitted to believing that this is okay if it comes from their side, because there's probably a purpose to it. Like it doesn't, the pedophilia stuff is just to suck you in and fool you and trick you. And then once they get you in there, their real purpose is honestly, the real purpose is for you to become a Donald Trump supporter. That's really what it comes down to.
Well, yeah. should we say QAnon a few more times in case this video hasn't been demonetized yet? Uh, YouTube said that news coverage and discussion of QAnon, as long as it's not targeting anyone, which we didn't, is okay. Oh, so good. you don't say. They got a person making these evaluations? Well, we might, I, I checked my channel because I have a lot of videos with QAnon in the title. And they're all safe. So I'm assuming that the algorithm is being a bit careful. Maybe. Well, good for them. Yeah, there's a there's a bit of a mix of human algorithm sort of thing going on there. And you, I don't know how well we're doing with our... You have to self-report. This is boring. Anyway, hopefully we're good <laughs> on this. <laughs> all right. Should we uh, take a call, guys? Let's do it. Let's take the calls. I love the calls. Uh, let's go to the first one here. Uh, 917. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Pepper from Seattle. Pepper from Seattle? Yes. Could you speak just a little bit louder into your mic? You're just a little bit low. Other than that, you're coming in great. Yes. And, um, and I completely agree with you that there's this fine line between conspiracy theories and this more broader parapolitical. And I think conspiracy theories like Pizzagate uh, are easy to shut down because they become too specific. But QAnon has been so successful because it's broad and it kind of seeps its way through Facebook. And um, you know, my, my, my question for you is, uh, is, there a, is, is there policy that can actually combat this and keep up with this? Um, how, how do you address something that's so insidious and spreading so uh, rapidly? I don't think you could do go policy when it comes to this. You can go the policy route when it comes to this stuff. Cause I think that actually, I, I agree. We'll just embolden it. I, I actually think, you know, right. recent, recently there was that vote in the, the house, I believe to basically, uh, basically speak out against you. The vote was basically to just basically say, I am against QAnon. And I think the play from Democrats was smart, basically in terms of just getting certain Republicans on record to not being able to do that. But, and, and that's why I think this is maybe one, one very rare exception. I think it, it was, this one was okay. But for the most part, I would say that if you had like, you know, everyone voting against, uh, you know, voting against and saying, I agree, QAnon is bad, that will feed into the conspiracy even more. But this, this, this time around though, I do think that the benefit of getting these Republicans to say they could not, you know, downplay QAnon they cannot attack QAnon. I think that was worth whatever little bits they gave to QAnon because, you know, at the end of the day, that's not really going to change QAnon, the people who believe in QAnon's mind or whatever. But it's, um, it's very tricky to come up with a policy solution to this within our current framework, right? Because we have a thing called the First Amendment that says people can say whatever they want, short of, you know, yelling fire in a crowded theater, I guess. And I think there is an argument to be made that this is somewhat analogous to this when you have guys showing up with guns to pizza places. But I doubt that our current government, certainly our current courts would uh, agree with me on that because they're just going right. to do whatever benefits the far right because that's what they've been put there to do. I mean, looking looking ahead, like the, the problems, the reasons why we have conspiracy theories are not they're not something that can be solved by policy. Like, I would be fine with the government restricting the flow of speech in this way, actually, especially if we were to nationalize these, uh, these outlets. I realize that's kind of controversial. But like, we really need to be treating the root causes of these things that are taking advantage of our liberal values and our liberal society to, you know, undermine the very basis for that society. Um, we need to be regrowing social bonds. People are so alienated right now. And a big reason why they fall into this is because they're lonely. They're staring at their screens they need community and this is something that affects people with money this is something that affects people without money this is one of those offshoots of capitalism where there's not like a one-to-one -one correlation between someone's class and the effect of this phenomenon on them it affects almost everybody in this society so you know that's a really long answer but we really need to become less alienated from one another if we're ever gonna defeat this foe I mean, right. I two, think it, it has. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I was going to say two things really quick based on what Jamie said. The, 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 the yelling fire in a crowded theater is a perfect analogy for the QAnon stuff because they are picking very specific targets and then not so subtly, subtly saying that, you know, things have to be done. Like, you know, they'll, they'll say uh, 
Chrissy Teigen, and this is a real attack they've done on her. Chrissy Teigen, who's John Legend's wife, is uh, eating babies to rejuvenate her body. It's why she looks so young. Somebody has to do something about this to protect the babies. I mean, that to me sounds very, you know, dangerous. You're leading someone on to do something about this. What should they do? Hmm, it sounds like you're yelling fire in a crowded theater. And then, you know, uh, also, the, the coronavirus has obviously led to exactly what Jamie said. People have got sucked into QAnon uh, in numbers beyond belief because of the pandemic and the lockdowns and the quarantines. And that's really why we are now talking about QAnon uh, in the mainstream. And, and you, know, you know, the mainstream media is talking about it. And we're talking about it almost every week on this show, I feel like, at least. And, and that's, that's a major part of it. So, so, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Matt. It's a nightmarish acceleration of the alienation that already existed. Yeah, I, I mean, I would just say, like, it needs to be structural things, like, honestly, shorter work, day, work weeks. People need, frankly, just more time for both leisure and informing themselves. But also, uh, there's a story that came out um, from WVTF, Virginia's public radio station, about this woman who uh, worked for the, a company called Lee Enterprises, came and bought her newspaper, uh the, or earlier this year and it had already been slashed like crazy to the point where she on a thirty-six thousand dollars a year salary was doing a weekly paper 16 to 20 pages long per week and the only other people on staff were the advertising representative and the customer service representative and she's award-winning journalist she's won awards for for instance covering uh problems with the water system in the community so very important work that's being done and she did this story about how she's a one-person new room newsroom and immediately um this happened uh she was fired for it and uh for citing and the the company cited that and this was three days before her wedding so anyway this is a a one example of a huge trend that's going on exacerbated by these major social media giants like facebook who've just been vampirically leeching revenue from newspapers uh for a decade plus now and people can't people there's no money to inform people anymore like capitalism has failed the uh the demand to inform people it just can't do it so we need to massively change the corporate structure with like antitrust and i mean figure out a way the, the lee enterprises own 75 daily newspapers you that should not be allowed like that's a monstrosity that shouldn't have been allowed to grow that big uh mm-hmm. and so like those those sorts of things are the only way if we don't take care of this sort of thing the monopolization of media where every single local newspaper is actually owned by the same company, like thousands of miles away. Yeah. We're not going to be able to begin to fight this sort of stuff. Yeah. And that's a a great point. That's a great point. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. And that's a great point of you bringing up the local, uh, that local news story that you, I saw you tweet that out the other day and I was reading about that, that woman who got fired. It's horrible. But the, the point in bringing this up with the conspiracy theories is absolutely great, Matt, because, we know that there's a hunger for local news resources. People just inherently trust people, other people who live in their neighborhood and who are their neighbors. I mean, obviously. And we know this because look where most of this conspiracy theories, we saw this over the summer with the, the Antifa being bust into our quaint little towns, uh, uh, misinformation uh, that went all over the place. Where did this all fester? Where did this all get passed around? In local Facebook groups, you have people looking for local neighborhood news. They want to know what's going on down the block. They want to know, want to know what's going on in their main street, any town USA. They can't find a legit news source, but they did find uh, any town USA Facebook group with 15,000 other local people in it. They'll go there and they'll trust those people to tell them what's what more than anyone else. Because why would my neighbors lie to me? And that's I mean, we say that's like a perfect point, man. I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, someone needs to figure out how to take local news and and get it to the point where like it's Facebook groups because we see that there is a, a, an avenue for it. People want it. There's just gotta be a way to, to get it to them and have legitimate local news journalists and reporters being involved in getting that news to them. Yeah. Well, maybe now that everyone's unemployed, um, people will do it because they've got time on their hands. Well, maybe, you know, good ideas do come from things like, you know, you know, tragedy and, and horribleness, you know, but I don't know. 
Yeah, probably not. Who knows? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> anything um, anything I, you want to end on, caller? Yes, I do. I just I do want to end on something um, that I, I completely agree with you that policy can address this and that there's been a uh, kind of a vacuum in, in local local news and uh, information. And um, and uh, the thing that I want to add that I think is fanning the flames is uh, the amount of space that uh, is being left um, for, for for localities to interpret and decide what to do for themselves. I'll give my example, and that'll be it. For example, when uh, Betsy DeVos said that each locality needs to determine its COVID response because it knows its own situation best, and there's really no reason to give uh, uh, protocol. Well, that just gives space for people to create their own information and uh, and kind of decide for themselves in some sort of self-determination, but really it just breeds more of what you're talking about, which is um, bad info spreading quickly and kind of fans the flame. Right, right. Thanks again for calling. This was really great uh, okay. that you brought what you brought up and that's mm-hmm. some great conversation. Thanks. Thanks for hanging on the line too. Thanks. I totally forgot you were there. <laughs> Yeah, hey, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate everything that you do. Ah, thank well, you. Thank you. We appreciate you. <laughs> appreciate all the listeners, even the ones who talk trash about me. Mm. <laughs> I don't Nine appreciate one... the ones who talk trash about me. Uh, they could f off. <laughs> Nine one four. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Um. Hi, my name is. Uh, well, I'll go by Jamal Bostan. Um, so I wanted to talk about the debate that Sam and Jamie were having on, on Monday's show about the Supreme Court. Uh, Jamie was advocating for the abolition of the Supreme Court, and Sam was kind of showing that down as a long-term project. Uh, and I wanted to propose another solution where we can effectively abolish the Supreme Court through constitutional means. Go right. on. So essentially, Let's hear this. Okay. So essentially, since the, since the Constitution doesn't enumerate a certain amount of justices on the Supreme Court, technically, a president could nominate every single adult age 18 to the Supreme Court. And that would be constitutionally legal. Additionally, Supreme Court justices also get compensation, so that could work as some kind of UBI. Ah, Mm -hmm. I like where your head's at. So every Supreme Court decision just becomes a nationwide referendum. Exactly. You know, those decisions (laughs) could not possibly be worse than the decisions coming out of the Supreme Court now. Even the ones, like, even if we got some decisions that I disagreed with that way, at least people will be deciding openly based on their values and the outcomes they want instead of pretending Mm. that it's about some ass backwards, uh, obscure legal principle that literally no one cares about. Yeah, I don't know. Like, referendums don't have the greatest recent history of being, you know, a dispassionate view of things. I mean, I, like, there's ways people of really get to, like, they're actually very confusing as far, like Brexit, for instance, what values were really there? I mean, there's a pro Brexit case that could be argued, but that was not enacted by the, you know, actual Brexit. Right. So like, I don't know, referendum, I think national referendums are, <laughs> I, I, I think we shouldn't have a Supreme court, but we should have courts that like are, obviously subservient to the you know judicial branch or the legislative branch does anyone remember what walter block's idea for for the justice system was when uh, he debated sam many many years ago i'm trying to remember exactly what it was but it was something but it was something like there's multiple different courts and there's different judges on each and when you want to have litigation you check the history of each particular judge and then you choose because it's a free market type system you choose which court system led by which judge you want to have your case tried this is the getaway with murder (laughs) judge right right so i don't i mean it's not exactly that because this definitely has a has a smarter idea behind it but yeah i i do think you know, there's a there's a lot. I mean, look what look what Uber and uh, is doing sort of with this prop. What is it? Prop twenty is it twenty two? I think it is, in, yeah. in California, where there, I mean, this is this is something where I think a lot of people don't really know all that much about, but they use people do use Uber, and 
Uber is using their app to send notifications telling their users how to vote on this prop. And that's definitely going to sway people who have really no idea what they're voting for. I like Uber. It gets me around. I'm going to help them out. And I don't have no idea what's going on. So I don't know about the referendum thing. I think people are just unfortunately way too uninformed to make these sort of decisions. Well, we also have to curb the power of corporate media at the same time. Otherwise, the yeah, no matter how much democracy we bring into it, it won't actually be democratic because people are being swayed by powerful forces. Right. And, this I mean, is, that's what, and that's, that's true what, of every, literally everywhere where people get to vote. That's why we vote for politicians, I feel like, over the, over the case of voting for these referendums, because the, a good politician's job is to explain these things to us so we know what they stand for and what they will vote for and make happen. Like That's why we like Bernie Sanders and AOC and Ilhan Omar and, and our favorite leftist politicians because they are very good at explaining exactly what they stand for. And we know based on that, that they will vote for policies that will get us there, even if we don't understand the wording of those particular policies. And when I mean we, I mean people as a whole, so, you know, the, the voting public. I mean, we can observe a, a bit of a hierarchy when we say that, like, if there was a position of power to be filled, it would be better to have Bernie Sanders in that than, say, even the average leftist, just because of, you know, general expertise. Like, I love the average leftist, but, you know, uh, this guy knows how to work this thing. I don't know. Uh, you got any more ideas before I say what I think about that, caller? Um, well, I just do want to say that I think obviously any sort of referendum system would be better than what we currently have, which is basically well, yeah. ruled by five and potentially six right wing hacks. And I think that there definitely should be some kind of limit set on what could be a, of those kind of referendums, but that would be something to do in the implementation of it rather than just the coming up with that now and i think that this is mostly just an idea for it and something that can be pushed for and then figured out later and also i would like some kind of constitutional scholar to look into this because this is just something i came up with <laughs> well i like your idea um i spend a lot of time thinking about future worlds with the help of great left to sci-fi by like ursula Le Guin and kim stanley robinson and one idea that I, is really reflected in the Mars trilogy, you know, no spoilers or anything, but like getting back to the idea of public service as something that average citizens really do as a selfless service to the collective. So like to have randomly rotating appointments in every government post, like it's like getting jury duty, you know, like, oh, I got judge duty again, gotta go do my best to hand down decisions that make sense for the for the polity and take away the professionalized aspect of it. Like Mark said, every cook can govern. And I really think that's true. And I think people need to become more civic minded. And obviously that's not going to happen overnight. But, you know, the society that I would like to see is really one from the bottom up where people aren't just uh, telling us what to do from on high, handing down these decisions, saying, oh, this is too complicated for you to understand it. No, people, I mean, obviously, once people are freed from wage labor, they would have more time and more inclination to educate themselves about the issues and participate in a civic way. And I think that would be healthier for everyone. Um, also, one thing someone brought up to me is um, we can reduce the power of the courts. We don't just have to um, pack the courts. That's, right? yeah. that's something that kind of feeds in and almost re-legitimizes the I feel like a lot of liberals there's their solutions their reforms here they want to re-legitimize the courts when I think the courts are being delegitimized no matter what anyone does so I think that we would have very good grounds to reduce their power and one way that we could do it um apparently guys did you know that the constitution does not guarantee the supreme court the right to constitutional review to overturn legislation for being un uh, unconstitutional, they granted mm -hmm. themselves that power way back in Marbury, Marbury versus Madison. They're like, oh yeah, we can do that because we said so. And everyone just went along with it forever. So like, I feel like there are some openings involved if the left ever did you know, gain control of the House and the Senate to say, hey, guess what? Marbury versus Madison, that's fake news. We don't have to do what you say. 
Yeah, I would just like to bring the words of Abe Lincoln back into this because I think they're so good, as in seeing this Matt Carp piece in Jacobin. If the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by decisions of the Supreme Court the instant they are made, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, like, I agree, like, like the court packing talk, right? Like, I feel like that is to a certain extent liberals gassing themselves up and trying to like have radical rhetoric when really like, I almost think it's better to not like it. The right is so much more keyed into, I think this kind of fight. And like, unless there is a huge piece of legislation that the Supreme court is standing in front of the Democrats are not going to be able to go up against the right just generally about the Supreme court. Um, So they'll need to pass something about it. Um, but ultimately, yeah, like the I, I can't I forget who said this, but the judicial system in any country should be like a backwater for like lawyers, right? That shouldn't it shouldn't be the main event, and that's why I guess that's maybe the main thing I have an issue with the referendum. It's like oh, every like a couple times a month, we're all gonna have to like inform ourselves about. Um, I mean, sure, if we could just let me know like which one is helpful for labor, right? I'll just check that off. But that 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 needs a second order like media ecosystem to help you educate yourself because it's all good and well to say like people can educate themselves but like we just said with the local news that they might be educating themselves with like a skeleton staff that's you know has a corporate gun to their head yeah, um, well right. this would this would happen in future world where presumably we have defeated the power of the corporate media yeah like i look forward to that I also want to just add that I mentioned uh, Prop 22 in California without giving any more details. You should vote no on Prop 22 in California if you are on the side of gig workers and don't want to help corporations like Uber and Lyft continue to take advantage of their contractual of their gig workers contractual status of being not actual employees when they basically are. Yeah, this is the entire uh, sort of scam that these rideshare companies are running and that this is a proposition to help them continue running that scam. So vote no on it. Yeah. No. Yes. I want to be completely clear. But did you, did you see this, that Uber, cause I brought it up and I, I guess because my, my brain is so in, in, into these things, I just assumed everyone saw it. Uber was using the notifications feature on their Uber app to tell anyone who had the Uber, I guess they, they were able to pinpoint people in California, uh, people in California who had the Uber app installed on their phone, they sent them a push notification telling them how to vote on Prop 22. Yeah. There's Just oh unbelievable. I think Instacart I mean, also did yeah, something the- like that. They made their own workers give out propaganda telling people to vote against it. Yeah, like little right. inserts just- in their groceries that the workers yeah. put in. <laughs> so let's do a little majority report counter to this. Every uh, con- California listener to this, Text a few. Text all your other California voting friends. Vote no on Prop Twenty Two. Or because, post it on social media. Yeah, po- and post it on social media. But I mean, the text probably going to get. Make sure that the texting. I think is a medium. Text people banking. Vote, right, like actually texting people you know and telling them what's up with certain things, like so they don't have to like read about it themselves. Or, like try to make it up on the try to make up their mind on the spot in the ballot box. Like that, it's going to have a huge effect. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, I wonder how many people when they when they go to the go to vote and they see the referendums, how many of them actually know what they like me, for example, when I go into a ballot uh, in, into the poll location in New York, I actually will pull up my phone and, and, and read about each referendum before voting on each one. I mean, I doubt many people do that, unfortunately, but I, I, that, that's what we're dealing with. Again, that's why Uber knows that, wow, send people a push notification, tell them how to vote. People like using Uber. They'll think they're doing what's best for, for them without realizing that they're probably hurting all their friends and family members who are probably driving for Uber. Meanwhile, like the Uber and Lyft drivers are pressured to say that they actually support it. Right. Right. So we want to vote against it. I feel like I misspoke earlier. No on Prop 22. No. Don't, doesn't matter how it's read when you, when you read the wording and it's no, if you support gig workers, and don't want Uber to continue, as Matt accurately called it, the scam of not considering them to be actual, their workers to be actual employees. You want no, N-O on Prop 22. And if there's an option to vote hell no, you should take that too. There you go. Or maybe uh, request another ballot because that one might not be the official one. <laughs> right, <laughs> yeah. 
And do not write hell in front of the no, because that will probably invalidate your ballot completely. Again, Jamie, terrible advice. Don't listen to Jamie. <laughs> Uh, you can't take me anywhere. Ooh. Ooh, I, I saw someone, I saw someone tweet, tweet out their ballot, their, their ballot, and they filled in the bubble for Biden and then wrote, drew an arrow underneath it and then wrote only because I'm forced to, because he was, because my real choice, Bernie Sanders got pushed out in the primary break. Listen, if that's how you feel fine. And if you, this was just like something you wanted to take a picture of and you never really meant to vote for Biden do fine. But you just invalidated your ballot. You know for sure that's being thrown out. And if it's not thrown out automatically, when the Republicans go to try to uh, re, uh, turn or uh, uh, fight the uh, the election results, and the courts say we have to look through all the ballots now, that one will be one that's thrown out. Like, don't do things like that. Don't do things like that if you actually want your vote to count. Please. Sorry, guys. I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> Um, can we uh, do something fun, uh, Brendan? If you have that uh, Huckabee clip, uh, I was just going to say this. Thing. I haven't even seen that clip, but I read the description on the sound sheet, and I'm like, I want to see. This. So I was doing some uh, research for the Majority Report uh, last night, as I usually do by watching the Go Off Kings Twitch stream, and uh, Huck Watch is what they do once a week. And so this, this is, I, I'm stealing this from now, but it is very funny because. Mike Huckabee has this weird sort of like show for seniors that he does um, in Tennessee. And he, they've kind of, they have this new segment where they take questions from Twitter. And the first couple of questions were like, kind of like the standard fare of lunatic, you know, Huckabee fan questions. But then he gets into a couple that are not friendly and he's not really prepared to, uh, to answer them. All right. See, that was a fun one. That was a little better. So maybe you got something else. Go uh, hold on. Uh-oh. Here we go. Okay. Carol Griffiths from Hot Bottom, Pennsylvania. That's really a place? <laughs> Hop Apparently Bottom? Apparently so. Hot Bottom, Pennsylvania. I'll get some letters for that. I'm yeah. sure you guys questioning it. Okay, go hold ahead. On, press I'm pause curious how Christian... Is this the Price is Right voice guy? It sounds just like him. <laughs> I mean, uh... Maybe it's a stunt double. No, I think there's just like a whole generation of men who wanted to do this basically and just tried to sound like the price is right guy in hopes that he got hit by a bus and they could take over <laughs> <laughs> all right continue christian worships two gods donald trump stands for nothing that we do and goes against every principle that we believe in you lick his boots and bow at his feet because he's republican you sold your soul for a couple of judges that will help him destroy us as a nation if he was a Democrat, what would you be saying about him? I can't even begin to imagine what we would be flowing from your lips regarding this evil. Lying, blaspheming, heartless, philandering, cursing person. <laughs> if he had a D by his name, this is either a cult mentality or worshiping a false god. Which is it? Very long tweet. Thank you for your love. <laughs> I, I truly appreciate your kindness. Look, let me tell you something. If, if there was a president who was a Democrat who was as pro-life as Donald Trump and believed in sep, uh, supporting and protecting young unborn babies, if they believed right in away. lowering taxes and letting people keep the money that they worked really hard for instead of the government taking it and wasting Very it, biblical. if they really did believe in trying to create a peaceful environment in the Middle East and were able to acknowledge that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and that the <laughs> Golan Heights belongs to Israel and would move the embassy... And if they would, cut seven regulations for every one of the ones that have come up so that small businesses can function and won't have the government's foot on their neck all the time, making it's it impossible for Jesus. them to succeed. And if there was a Democrat president who would also try to solve problems instead of just uh, be obstructive, and if they would appoint Supreme Court justices that believe in the Constitution as it is written, uh, you know, guys like Gorsuch and maybe uh, Kavanaugh and Amy Coney Barrett, as well as Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito. If, if, if that were all the case and a Democrat president did that, I'm going to tell you what I would do. As you would say, I'd lick their boots too. I probably would. Well, I wouldn't actually lick their boots, but I would shine their shoes and I would be very happy. So bring me a Democrat like that and I will be more than happy to jump up and support them and shout for the heavens. Feel but until... That happens, and they keep wanting to bring one that believes that it is okay to take 60 million babies and take their lives. I'm sorry. I ain't going to be silent about that. 
That's my yeah. answer. So, there you yeah, go. stop it there. Um, I mean, really, she goes to show the uh, place of um, uh, the place of uh, abortion in their politics. I'm just seeing Brendan's face screen now. Is that what everybody else is seeing? No. Oh, what are you guys see seeing? I see you. Oh, oh, okay, okay. There we go. Never mind. All right, we're cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, there's one more. So, I mean, the, if people didn't look, uh, couldn't see on you know the audio stream. He gave himself a hundred seconds and he had to fill up the entire time to respond to that. And, you know, he got off the God stuff very quickly. If I remember it immediately following that, Brendan, if we still have it available, there's another uh, sort of uncomfortable question for him. It's also important to note that he admitted he's a bootlicker for Trump. That is really yeah, the top line, was... Jamie. Thank you. Yes. I'll I lick would anyone's lick their boots. boots. I'd lick their boots too, he said. <laughs> so he was. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not bury the lead here. <laughs> Yeah, he wants point. the boots lined up and him just going across it like you would slide your fingers across the piano keys. I wouldn't lick their boots, but I'd shine their shoes. Oh, good one. Okay. Yeah, here we go. With your tongue. It, it Loving better. questions. You got another one? It gets better, yeah. Okay, good. Charles yeah. Mearsman. That's Charles Mearsman uh -huh. from South really Bend, Indiana. Like wrote. Charles Mills Mearsman wrote, you are anti-American. Oh. You lie about America almost as much as your daughter does. Oh. Charles Mearsman oh. wrote that. <laughs> Are you sure it was Charles Mearsman? It, it, was. it was. Okay. It was. It wasn't me. Look, I don't lie as much as my daughter. She's no. I'm just kidding. I'm not going <laughs> to. All I can do is say I am so sorry I've disappointed you. But aren't you glad you never have to vote for me again? Because I'm hosting a show and not running for anything. So, thank God for what you can thank God for, and that's something you can thank God for if you do want to. It's fine. It's up to you. Okay. Uh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> not a fun segment. For Huckabee, I don't think. Like it really, I, it's penance. <laughs> it's he's he's involving <laughs> penance in his late night talk show. He's a, about Christianity. I think it's pretty uh, accurate. He was also so thrown off that his first go to was to throw his daughter under the bus. Amazing. <laughs> this is a very revealing segment. Actually, I think we it should really is. This. Yeah, yeah, these schools do not like each other. Um, it really adds something to it, too, to have the voice from The Price is Right be reading all these questions. <laughs> right. I, feel, I almost feel bad for him in a way because, like, ultimately what he reveals in that second clip is that, like, he did all this work, but really all he wanted to do was host a late night talk show 100%. about the things he wanted to talk about. What, what so, is like, the, maybe, the... maybe podcasting is the way to keep, like, the, <laughs> the worst people from electing higher office or something. I don't know. Right. But where I mean, is this? Where is this show broadcast? Like it, uh, it looks like a studio Tennessee. program. Tennessee, no, but I mean, a live audience. Christian what, Broadcast what, Network, I think. Christian Broadcast. Ah, I'm trying to see. Okay, so it looks like the reason this announcer sounds like a professional, we might have even heard him before, is because he's the former announcer for the Grand Ole Opry. Oh, um, nice. And then he and then he lost that job, and uh, this well, is strength to strength. <laughs> <laughs> gotta go work for mike huckabee you so know he's not, a job creator it's not cbn it's tbn which i guess oh, is another Tr Tr trinity, trinity, trinity broadcasting uh, network yeah, yeah. yeah. i do yeah. have some sympathy for him as someone who also works at a show where people are allowed to say things to us <laughs> whatever they want but like i feel like our our fans our listeners are a lot less hostile maybe because right. we're better than him I, I mean, the, if your if your comebacks are, I'd lick their boots too if they were as insane as uh, Republicans, uh, or my I lie less than my daughter. Like, not. I mean, I I'm surprised. Like, didn't you take a pass at these before, or was it the first time he was seen? That? I mean, respect if that was impromptu. Yeah. Because I was going like, to say that too. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, did not seem like he was prepared to fill up the entire time he was allotted. Yeah. If it wasn't impromptu, um, that's actually pretty sad. I hope they continue yeah. the segment. Yes. <laughs> and speaking of uh, letting people harass us on this show, uh, 847, what's your name? Where are you calling from? I would never harass you. <laughs> How you Although doing? You, Matt, Matt, you're my favorite. Nancy Pelosi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Did you see this? Did you see this clip? Everyone's attacking poor Nancy about <laughs> where she was fighting with Wolf Blitzer. I mean, she feeds people and she takes care of them. She shelters them. She, whatever else she said, that's she what she does. Up sheets of paper. She's out there yeah. on the bread lines doing mutual aid every single day. The mutual aid, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, Food, not uh, bombs. 
I mean, I feel like that would be a really great character. You know, I could almost imagine Michael Brooks doing mutual aid Pelosi right now or something like it. <laughs> Bringing we up just, like Antifa uh, style stuff. And, we yeah. just need to build up dual power in this country. So eventually when we expropriate the bosses, we'll have a power structure ready to go. I can, I can, I'm, We're I'm hearing Pelosi do the, this weekend. <laughs> I'm hearing Pelosi do the anti-fascista tweet, uh, the anti-fascista chant, I should say. Pelosi, <laughs> doing one of those, man. All right. Well, what do you like? To, what would you like to call it about? <laughs> oh, uh, this is Josh from Chicago, by the way. How you doing, Josh? Good. How are you? Good. Thanks. What's up? Um. Yeah. I just wanted to. I mean, I know we've been. Uh, you guys talked about it on Tuesday. Um. But I actually, so I listened to the whole Chomsky, um, Brianna Joe Gray, Girls of Texas debate. Uh, and actually, the first episode I listened to you all was the Jimmy Dore episode uh, from 2016. Because uh, I found your show because I started being really uh, skeptical and angry at some of the things that Jimmy was saying. And then I found your debate with him. You're smart. Like, you're you're already gonna, a smart man. These, these I could already tell you're already a smart but man. I was really disappointed by two smart people in how myopic their view of change is. Um, because I, I, I think Virgil and Brianna... Like my my issue is that like uh, so I I I, I sent well, I have to send my ballot in but I, I circled the the box next to Biden's name on the Working Families Party thing um and, and for me like the point that Chomsky is trying to say and I was actually very disappointed too because there's some very I think arguments being made that Chomsky is like an electoralist or that he's advocating that he's putting a lot on elections and like I think the point he was trying to make. And the reason I'm disappointed is like they are putting so much on who you vote for. Like, like the theory of change is like that so much on the ballot box. Who you vote for or don't vote for. Yeah. And it's just like, to me, it takes, you know, voting takes five minutes. You do it. or Um, Not for everyone. Understand their suppression. Right. That's, that's a good point, Jamie. But no, I I get what you're saying. Uh, it's like it's not a leftist theory of change that they were promoting. It's not it's not a Marxist theory of change. It's not. I mean, to me, it's the organizing that you do outside of it that is the real politics that Chomsky keeps getting at. And I was very disappointed with like the the limit the limited scopes of their imaginations, which, to be honest, was kind of similar to the way a lot of liberals think, which really pisses me off because they put so much emphasis and importance on voting and then they're just going to be on the sidelines for the next uh four years at brunch a lot of these liberals and i'm not i'm not saying brianna and virgil are liberals but they their theory of change that they're presenting to chomsky and i don't think they're really having a debate was basically in the um it, it echoed a lot of the sort of philosophy that liberals have have well, look, what was the what was the take on this show it. by the way jamie yeah what was what, what, i listened to up? it as well uh, and I get frustrated with people on both sides of this. As I've said before, whenever we talk about Jimmy Dore on this show, I think people on both sides are putting way too much emphasis on voting in either direction. And honestly, like I've said before, I can see this from both sides. Um, I think they it's not as simple as a lot of people make it out to be, but also like it's one of the least consequential acts you can do politically as an individual is cast a single vote or not cast a single vote. Um, There were things I agreed more with uh, Virgil and Brian and things I agreed more with Chomsky on. Um, Like the idea that there could be some sort of uh, orchestrated boycott of the vote on behalf of everyone who voted for Bernie and that that's going to move the Democratic Party to the left, I think is uh, a little silly. Um, If the Democratic Party ever moves to the left, it's going to be because of massive social unrest that forces their hand in the matter like we saw um, during the civil rights era. Um, they, They just 
don't care that much about winning. Like they're fine. Actually, it helps the people in charge of the centrist wing of the party when Republicans are in charge, because like we saw in this primary, they can use Trump as a boogeyman to scare people into voting for a more conservative choice. Like all of the people who said they believe in Medicare for all or even socialism, but voted for Biden anyway, citing beating Trump as their number one concern. So I don't think that makes a lot of sense. However, um, I want to disaggregate it from another thing that they were talking about, right? Because I think Bree, especially, uh, kind of jumped back and forth between this idea that this massive uh, disaffected Bernie people could somehow leverage their vote. And, you know, in a system which tells us this is your primary way to exercise political power, whether that's true or not, you know, a lot of people believe it. Um, and then there's another group of people that probably overlaps, but is not exactly the same group of people that she kept trying over and over again to get Chomsky to recognize and he wouldn't do it, which is, you know, people like some of her family members who live in swing states who are working class, who are black, who don't normally vote because they don't think it's going to make a material difference in their lives, right? Uh, things are already really, really bad for them. So when Chomsky says, oh, it's your job as an activist to convince these people that they need to vote for the lesser of two evils, even though uh, they're not going to get health care out of it, even though they're not going to get uh, an increased life expectancy out of it, probably um, because of climate change. Like, she's like, really, you want me to go to my 68 year old aunt who makes seven dollars an hour bagging groceries, who doesn't vote because she doesn't think it's going to do anything for her and say, OK, I know. Uh, Joe Biden it told you to go F yourself where healthcare is concerned um, and he's not going to do anything to change your material circumstances, but you have to do this because of climate change. And if you don't understand that you're an idiot and I'm going to shame you like, no, I'm not going to do that. And her aunt is not going to live long enough to see climate change because um, black women have a lower life expectancy than a white man like no Chomsky. So like that part was very frustrating to me that he refused to acknowledge all of the reasons why people would not be voting, not as a strategy, but just as, you know, a, a rational choice in their lives. And he also refused to acknowledge um, the personal risk that people, especially these people, would be taking on, especially this year, to, like, it's not, it, he kept saying it takes 10 minutes, it takes 10 minutes. No, actually, for people in poor neighborhoods and poor Black neighborhoods, you have to, uh, take time off from work. You have to wait in line for hours. You have to expose yourself to COVID, knowing that your chances of dying from COVID are much, much higher than a rich white person's chances of dying from COVID in order to cast a vote for somebody who's not going to do shit for you. And he did not respond to that at all. All right. I mean, I haven't listened to it yet, so I don't know the entirety of what, what was said, but I do know that it got a lot of play online because of the clips that Brianna and Virgil chose to put out there and the commentary they added to those clips. And I mean, I, my, my take is they think they've had a really good conversation with, with Noam Chomsky. Like the idea that when Virgil tweeted that uh, they, they tweeted, they, a vid the they tweeted that he, he tweeted that they won the debate, but also included it with the clip that made Noam Chomsky look, honestly, I think look better than they did in that particular clip. So I don't think he was actually, I don't think he really thinks that. I think they, believe no. they put out a great episode uh that's a good it's a conversation no winner in a debate just two sides two ways of thinking both people are right both people are wrong uh, both sides are right both sides are wrong i guess i should say because there's two people on one side and noam chomsky on the other um and yeah i, I think people that fell for what was really a, honestly a good marketing tactic on their end i mean that's really what it was i'm sure they got a lot more listens to the show than than usually. And I mean, I know it's a new show, so they probably got a bunch of new signups too. And credit to them, I got to take notes because I got to replicate that on my own show. No, they broke the internet. <laughs> yeah, I have to replicate that on my own podcast that I have too. So I think you, you brought up something though that I want to, you brought up something though that I want to, I want to focus on here. And that's, you said you voted for uh, the Biden Harris ticket on the working families. Party yeah, line. I did. And, it's like, and um, that is, that is the move here. I want to make sure people know this because yeah. I, I know, to me, the real discussion going on here really isn't you're going to vote for uh, Biden now because I think most people, unlike 2016, most people on the left are now resigned to realizing what they should do right now just to mitigate harm and then that the real work begins 
uh, when Biden, if Biden wins. I, I mean, you can just look at the, the discourse. There's a lot less I'm not voting for Biden on the left than there was oh, I'm not yeah. voting for Hillary. Um, but, but the working families thing, I know they got a lot of backlash and rightfully so during the primary for endorsing Warren over Bernie. And I'm actually a bit worried that people are not going to vote on the, well, the left won't vote on the working families ticket where they can. Uh, I think they will. They will. Uh, I hope so. I don't know. A lot of, working families a lot of, is very, like, is very good when it comes to local races. They are very helpful. They were very helpful. I can tell you from direct experience, very helpful in defeating the IDC in the yeah, 2018 IDC. midterms here in New York. And people don't know the IDC were the Cuomo backed Democrats in the New York state Senate who basically voted along with the Republicans. Yes. And they stopped a lot of, uh, they stopped a lot of uh, good policy in New York because they voted along with the Republicans Uh, and they were defeated with big help from the working families party in 2018. And now Cuomo, now, now Cuomo basically has to basically go along with some of these policies that the Democrats are now able to pass or He's got to uh, shed the idea that he's got progressive bona fides and speak out against them himself instead of hiding behind the fact that, oh, no, look, bipartisan Republican, uh, bipartisan uh, Republicans and I Democrats do? voted I, against them. I have yeah. my hands tied. Right. Yes, yeah. exactly. No, it, they've done a lot of good work. I, I think with working families, I think they'll be fine. Uh, I think there's a lot of activism towards getting people to vote on their line. And they also have like a really good like movement plan to like what they're going to do, like against pushing against Biden uh, in terms of like what they want to accomplish afterwards. Um, But I I just wanted to like my interpretation of what Chomsky was saying in that was he wasn't telling. I think what he was telling was his response to people is to think vote thinking about voting takes 15 sec 15 minutes in terms of the, the work in your political life. And I think what he was saying is in order, what he would tell the, the people in Brianna's family and Brianna is in order to get the change that you want, you, you take 15 minutes to go and vote and then you go and you organize and you, you are on the streets, you march, you protest, you do all the things that we need to do, mutual aid networks, to actually get some of these, these things done through, um, through what he calls his real politics. And I think my frustration with Brianna, with what she said, and she's a very smart person, she kept saying, I'm not an activist. I'm not an activist. It's like, well, we can't just be relying on the ballot box to, to make these changes. And sure. it was just to me. But then was, if we can't be relying on the ballot box, why is it so important that people go out and vote for Joe Biden then? Because it's harm reduction. Yeah, it plays a part, but you can't rely on it to get to yeah. where you want I to I mean, get to. Bri is much it's more a of step an towards that direction. I feel like me and Chomsky kind of came around to being like, okay, vote Biden is swing state for harm reduction purposes from like an ultra left position that doesn't privilege electoral tactics very highly in the leftist movement. Whereas people who take them more seriously, like, I don't know, Bernie Sanders, former press secretary, makes sense that she would be a little more hung up on that and the different machinations that we could do in order to uh, force some sort of realignment. Like ultimately... I agree a little bit more with Chomsky, but I, w- I was really annoyed that he refused, just straight up refused to acknowledge um, the stuff that she was saying about how actually it is really hard for working class people, for people of color to vote, especially in this election. And like, it's, it's, it's telling that the Democratic establishment went straight to vote shaming rather than trying to push Biden to adopt any of the policies that would actually make him a more popular candidate. And it's actually uh, really depressing that people like Chomsky and Angela Davis went straight to that before they even tried any kind of strategy like that. I mean, it's, it speaks to how weak the left is. But like, yeah, the he, he was trying to argue only with her, only with leftists who are like, we are going to withhold our vote as a tactic. But he refu- absolutely refused to talk about, um, you know, the 80,000 uh, black voters in, um, in Wisconsin who voted for Obama in 2012 and nobody in 2016. And what we would what the Democratic Party would need to do to engage those people and make a convincing case to them uh, beyond just telling them that they're idiots or that they're, I don't know, privileged unless they vote for their crappy candidate. 
Yeah, I don't know. I kind of felt like she held them. She used that as a shield, but um, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. they they, well, they got a lot have... of publicity out of this episode, so good for them. We'll just I have to agree to disagree, my, though. My Thank- and the, and the vast majority anyway, of people, he, I'm sorry, the vast majority of people who aren't going to vote for Joe Biden in this election fall into that category. They're not voters. They're not doing it as a tactic. They just uh, they don't think it has any effect on their lives, and they are probably right. I don't think it's. I, I don't think. Uh, uh, Jamie just froze up. Jamie just froze. Ooh, okay, no problem. Uh, caller, thanks for the call. Uh, we yeah. Will, uh, good luck with your Pelosi uh, stand. Oh, I, I thank you. I mean, listen, I'm not the only one here. I, Jamie's not on the line right now, so I'll, I'll, I'll admit this to the audience. Just like I'll, I have Nancy That's Pelosi just like a rhetorical posters. Drive. Whoa! Did you guys just? <laughs> yeah, you froze, Jamie, and then I tried to get it all in one swoop. Yeah, Zoom canceled fast. the last uh, little oh closing God. of your your monologue there. That was the really DNC. amazing. It's the goddamn DNC. They got to Jamie. Me. We don't fuck the DNC. Let's yeah. just all say fuck the DNC. There we go. All right. Thanks a lot, caller. Uh, Jamie, I gotta I gotta ask you now that you're back on. The, well, first of all, I was gonna say that uh, you have. Uh, I was in like while you weren't on the line, I was gonna let the audience know that you actually have. A Joe Biden big head, one of those big like life size posters of him looking at an ice cream on your wall right off camera, right? Because you've now resigned to your love of Joe Biden, right? Uh, oh my God. <laughs> but I was going to ask you, uh, your shirt it says "A Place to Bury." Is is that a pro Hillary Clinton shirt? What is it? Oh, okay, strangers. Uh, okay, a place to bury <laughs> Seth Rich. No, what? <laughs> I was going to say Vince now Foster, Seth Rich. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Whoops. All right, you guys want to? Oh my! Now I'm choking. You guys want to go to another call? We've got some good calls today. I think, sure. uh, unless there's a clip you want to get to. Do it. we have that Rudy Giuliani clip of him talking, thinking he's he, the the camera's cut already? I just uh, remember that. Don't, no. All right, it's not it's not so great, I guess, but it's pretty funny. No need to stop and find it. Um, let's go to another call. Mine's well. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Always like when he calls. Eight one eight. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, hi right, guys. Um, girl boss enthusiast and the rest of the crew. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Dave in Jamaica. I knew it was you, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Actually, I don't think you guys are retreaded the ground, but I also listened to the infamous um, Brie Virgil thing. And I came up with a completely different take because as I listened to the whole of it, from my perspective, it seems that Brie and Virgil wanted it to be a conversation about, since Joe Biden's the guy, what are the ways we can move him left? And then it kind of devolved into just vote for Joe Biden activism, but no details. At least that's my interpretation of it. And then usually that's where the frustration and the anger and the stuff afterwards came from. But I think that is the major thing people really should focus on. I don't think anybody is saying not voting will work because, you know, it, it won't work. But what are the things that can be done to move Joe Biden to the left? Or is that maybe there's not much you can do and it's just a case of um, trying to get more AOC types into Congress or something like that. That's, it's that's just like, thing is like, sorry to Dave, but it's like, it's not a ballot box. It's not that People, the reason the Democratic Party is moving to the left and what will stop it mm-hmm. isn't people um, doing mm-hmm. lesser evil voting. That's that's not the problem. Mm-hmm. Like AOC and Ilhan and Cory Bush are going to do way more to the Democratic Party than mm-hmm. any like Green Party strategy. Maybe if there no, was a, a more concerted one, like, you know, leading into years in advance and Trump wasn't the bogeyman that the centrist Democrats could use to basically discipline people against this kind of strategy, it might have some plausibility. I, I think- no, no, I, uh, I, I, sorry to interrupt, Jamie. Uh, not, uh, maybe I broke up or something. I didn't mean that. I generally am skeptical of third parties because uh, looking at the dynamics, especially with countries that have multiple parties, it usually just boils down to the conservatives versus the not. And then multiple parties seem to make it easier for conservatives to win with lesser percentages of the vote because they were able to achieve that majority. That's my skepticism on third parties. And any very good third party ends up just consuming some lesser party. So that's Dave. my kind of view. Of it. I think it really Dave, depends Dave. on the system generally. 
Did you read the uh, the homework I gave you yesterday about um, my caucus? Uh, my, my caucus released an professor art- Professor Peck. I'm sorry, I did not. <laughs> I no, sent I it to all of you. Cause, no, cause no, you- I didn't have time to go. Go ahead. Because you've been talking about uh, third parties, and I think a lot of people have sort of a limited conception of what a party is and what a party does, because we only know about it, like the Democrats, the Republicans. Occasionally, there's like an ineffectual Green Party or Libertarian Party or whatever. So when I talk about how we need a workers party, they think of a party as some some uh, a ballot line. And someone who, uh, an organization that only does elections, and they think, oh, that's not going to work. No. Um, What I am talking about when I talk about the Workers' Party is something a little bit different, Um, something that does a whole lot more than just elections. Um, The party, I don't know, you want to take it from Lenin, you want to take it from various anarchist thinkers, like every anti-capitalist tradition, practically, unless they're anti-party, like the German-Dutch Council Communists, which we talk about on this week of the Antifada, they have their own concept Mm -hmm. of the party. And basically what the party is, is an explicitly political organization that serves to stitch together all the different struggles, whether we're talking about labor struggles, uh, struggles against uh, racism and police violence, um, struggles for housing, stitches all of those struggles together and coheres a vision with and from and then back to because there is a, a real back and forth, uh, the, the people on the ground, mm-hmm. the working class and a party can occasionally, you know, if they think it's tactical to do so. Uh, I think the party, as we conceive of it, would run uh, elections, people in elections, uh, parasitically on the Democratic ballot line, or, you know, occasionally it Mm -hmm. might be uh, the Republican ballot line that they run on. Um, I'm not sure when or where, but I'm sure there are situations where they do that. Um, And Mm -hmm. these people running, they're socialists, they're not Democrats, um, but, you know, they're using it to advance a socialist agenda and that could mean passing legislation that empowers working class people to fight it could mean spreading the message of class consciousness because the way most people not everyone but the way like some working class people engage with politics is via the electoral system so you know like Lenin thought, it would be foolish to abandon the the bourgeois parliaments, as he called them, to uh, you know more conservative forces. We need to go in and contest that space. Um, but then once they're in there, you know, uh, our electeds are subject to all sorts of powerful forces dragging them to the right. Um, and even if, uh, say, a socialist party were to get into power, which would be very difficult in this country, but it's happened in lots of countries in Europe. Um, Even if the Socialist Party gets into power, um, they still are managing a capitalist economy, right? Uh, Until you transition to socialism, you're managing a capitalist economy. So a lot of these parties, like Syriza, have been subject to uh, the, the forces of capital, and they've become the administrators of austerity, even though they never meant to do that. And it's not like they lost their way. These are This is just what the economy is doing to them. So what's the solution to that? Well, first of all, you know, it's got to be a transitional thing. It's a transitional Mm -hmm. measure, like just getting the workers party in power or just getting, um, you know, socialists in power on the democratic ballot line. That's not enough. We got to be moving towards socialism all the time. Um, But how do you do that? And how do you hold them to task? Well, uh, it helps, I think, to have an independent social movement or organization like the party uh, that has independence from the Democrats or the Republicans, and it has its own base of power. It has its own social base. It has lots and lots of activated people, working class people who are going to hold the electeds accountable. And I think DSA has some signs of becoming that. It does some of the things that a party does, but, you know, we're going to need to take a lot more steps from here to there to become like a real party. But anyway, that is all to say um, when we when I talk about having a party, having a workers party, um, I'm not just talking about a ballot line. And in fact, I think as we've seen with the Green Party and the Working Families Party, uh, maintaining a ballot line takes a lot a lot of work within our current dumb system that could be better used uh, elsewhere to build power. Well, I guess what I was about to say, though, I don't think we're actually speaking. Oh, what is it now? 
I don't think we're disagreeing per se. Because like when I'm saying I'm not saying a ballot line, like you when I when I say a third party usually consumes or another party or something like that. What I'm saying like with the AOCs and whatnot, in a way that is kind of the same thing, in a in the sense that she represents and is beholden to different groups of people, right? So I think we're you saying the same things, but we're calling it different things in that sense because we're trying you're trying to change the structure of whatever system you're in, right? So whether it, does it really need to be named um, a third party if it accomplishes the same goals, right? Because I just said it was yesterday when you guys are saying. The Republicans used to be the radical Republicans centuries ago, right? And the Democrats used to be the KKK party. So, and they changed over time. And I would, I would guess it would be due to act. Um, yeah, social movements. Like that. Right. I mean, like there was there was fellow travelers in the New Deal Democratic Party alongside the segregationists, right? And that had an effect. And you could see that, like the various sort of contradictions there play out when they had power um but it was better than having the like the wall street and then the financiers in power um in in the, at least in the sense of um you know uh collapsing inequality and publicly providing certain goods and i, and I so as, as jamie was right to explain i don't think we actually disagree i just think <laughs> it might actually be a definition thing going on because if if something is changing the party structure within, whether it be a third party or not, it, doesn't it accomplish the same goals? Or am I reading this wrong, Jamie? Um, what are, are you asking, like the about the realignment strategy versus the sort of uh, uh, com- mm-hmm. confrontational strategy that I just outlined? Right. Um, you know, I think we have a lot of historical examples of a realignment of the Democratic Party failing. And uh, ultimately, maybe it moved a little bit to the left. I'm thinking like in the civil rights era, but only as an effort to uh, act as a pressure valve for the more radical elements of the movement. And I think there's not a lot of historical precedent for uh any political party actually being effectively realigned as a socialist party. I think it makes a lot more sense to have, um, to to do what I said, to parasitically use their ballot line and to have an independent organization um, holding them to account. Like, like we saw with a lot of the pink tide governments in Latin America. I wish Michael were here. This is not my area of expertise, but as I understand it, there were social movements, uh, independent social movements that had sort of a special relationship to uh, these socialists once they were in power. And even though the socialists might have had a, a complex or contradictory record once they were in there, it acted as a counter, a countervailing force. Because like, if we give up on uh, on running candidates at all, on contesting elections, like, it seems like it would be foolish to do that in our current context when, um, oh shit, my phone's ringing. God, I was really, I was really on one. And now, uh, who keeps calling right, me? Well, well, I'll just pick up on the, on the Bolivia thing. Like, I mean, Morales, when he was in power, faced a lot of street actions from the left, right? Like there, that it's a very active country. Um, and, but, and he works for, and he's part of the MAS, which my understanding, and again, like Michael would obviously know more about this than I would, but that's a movement towards socialism. There are more like extreme left-wing parties there that put pressure on Morales to do that. But he, he has like a sort of a general, I don't know if, I don't know if democratic socialists would be a way to classify that, but like, you know, and then uh, Morales himself was the first indigenous leader of the country. Uh, so you have those groups that are also very uh, uh, big in supporting him. Um, and with the elections coming up, like all those groups are coming back. Um, to support Moss again. Um, like, I, I, I honestly don't think you can be, I don't think you can be definite. Frankly, like, I think the revolution was closer around uh, the 70s than it is now, because when you had commitments towards things like higher education and things like that, that have been just, I mean, we've been taken, we've been going way backwards since then. And I think we were in a better right. position because of where um, 
where and obviously this isn't just the new deal democrats you also have communism as like a huge threat to it so you need to provide a whole lot more right and that actually that mm-hmm. those sorts of things do um have an impact and it's not because the democratic party was invented to do that ultimately it was very much not um and uh, there are definitely going to be things like james said about capitalism and operating within it but the good news for the left in the united states is if we like our impacts like morales got in power he's having to like open up oil exploration and stuff like that right like because and we have such a position in this global economy that little changes to the power structure have a bigger effect than they do slightly more peripherally i would yeah uh, there are there are pros and cons to doing socialist organizing in the imperial core for sure uh God, I forgot what I was going to say, uh, but like the not, idea that the no, idea that we can rely on a party just by voting for the right people is madness. That's never no, no, no. Never right. how it that, works. That, I, I, I was going to suggest that because I I will agree with Chomsky on one point that it is not voting, relatively speaking, is the easy easy part. It's the doing pressuring being active and knowledgeable is the hard part and that's the part i'm worried about because people are stressed out as is right <laughs> long hours most people just want to go go to sleep and that's the that's the, that's the tricky part of it but the at least again going back to the interview i did not i don't think that was their intent but i think the frustration of the current system we're in right where we all know if Trump wins, likelihood of anything happening is not going to happen. But we, all, we also know pushing Biden left seems like a very, I wouldn't say unlikely, but not, we're not going to get too much fruit from that either because there's no mechanism in there to kind of guarantee that leftward push. So mm-hmm. at least that's why I see this whole um, thing, the frustrations coming out from yeah. it because of the reality of that. Yeah. Uh, well, the left has no power, right? So mm-hmm. it makes sense that Brie would look to mm-hmm. one of the only uh, concrete examples of power that she sees people having, which is the vote. But you know what? There are no shortcuts here. We got to be building. Uh, mm-hmm. We got to be building institutional but, power, in de- class independent right. institutional power. Like there are really no shortcuts, and it's scary because uh, you know, like you guys are talking about. Uh, class power is low right now we're in a crisis we're in full neoliberalism uh, i think the working class was in a much better position to fight this stuff back in the 60s and 70s but um unfortunately uh the barbarism won it was socialism or barbarism right capitalism was in crisis in the 1970s there was a crisis of profitability and uh guess what we got barbarism aka neoliberalism so where do we go from but, here uh-huh it- that, yeah, that is the question on all of our minds, right? And I guess from a country which has very low voter turnout also, I think, it, as I said, it look, if the polls are to believe, I think Biden's going to win. So Trump's going to actually have to legitimately steal it to, get, to win it, right? Wow. Well, who, who knows, yeah, honestly? I he mean... knows, right? But the, the, the major issue is, though, that when somebody becomes voter apathetic, they are very hard to win back. Because usually the only time those guys come back is when you have the power to materially increase, make their lives better. And that's when they start voting for you, at least from my experience. Because yeah. if, if even, even not knocking mutual aid or anything like that, but if you can't help them today, they're, they're not necessarily a reliable ally for the future just because of the material condition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a catch I, I think Brie was Right. And I think Brie, what Brie was trying to say is, yes, if Trump wins, it could be the end of human existence. But if my, in my, if my personal life, my world has already ended, what's the difference? Mm-hmm. I think that's what she was trying to say. That's the apathetic vote, voter yeah. mindset. I've seen myself. When, yeah. If you and have no to argue to with. Lose, your world has already ended. Right. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta, all I gotta yeah. say is I really gotta study what Virgil and Brianna did because my God. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I, I think yeah, the point yeah, is, it's, it's, 
can I just say, it's not meant to be argued with, and it's not like possible to argue with it. It, it is the party's job to do that, right? But like, there's a difference between that and then when you're starting to talk about voting strategies to try to teach the party a lesson. That's not voter shaming. That is, right. that is criticizing electoral strategy that, frankly, I haven't seen ever work. If, if, if there is an uh, abstinence campaign, I would love to know about it that has actually like delivered results. But I don't think it works like that. I don't think votes are analogous to withholding labor uh, to a boss, right. which is the analogy people always make about this stuff. The Democrats don't care if you don't show up to vote like your boss doesn't care, like would care if you didn't show up to work. And that's like, that's I don't know. Well, it's a catch 22, right? Because uh, people won't vote for progressives if they haven't seen evidence that voting will. They will. They interest, vote for Cory Bush but... and AOC and Ilhan. Like okay. they, and, and they're winning their primaries in red states. Like I, the well, example yes, is there. Are, there. there are counter examples, but I'm trying to illustrate this catch 22, right? You got to do something for people to get them to vote, but you got to be in power first to do something for people and you know we've seen people break out of that with some success like you were just talking about but i think it also speaks to the need for diversity of tactics because 40 percent of uh, people in this country don't vote and never will but you know they might be willing to go on strike they might be willing to uh form a tenant union against their landlord these points of immediate contact with capital with the people who are oppressing them that are not so many layers removed between between um, the, what we're talking about in the electoral sphere and their own realities, I think we need to be organizing everywhere in people's lives because not everybody is going to engage with voting. I have no disagreement with that. And I'll, as, as particularly ah, as long as like ah. focus, let me just finish what I'm saying. As particularly as long as lesser evil voting isn't prioritized as the big fulcrum by which the right is winning in this country. Because I, I don't think that's helping anybody. Go on, Matt. I just wanted well, to see. I'm I just sorry, wanted to I'm see sorry. more, more Peck versus Leck. I was looking forward to <laughs> fight, I'm, fight. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry to turn it into a drama call. Not my intent at all. But um, I, my, I generally agree with what you're saying. And the thing, I just, I guess I'm trying. I myself, I'm trying to figure out what is the best path. And I generally agree. I see more success with the Cory Bushes the AOCs, because they seem to have the ability to at least convince the people at least there's a possibility of what they want to be done being done. So I, I think that's the more success, more likely route right now. But we shall see, though, if, it, if we can get are, more of those types of trust, Congress, because there's no other option right now. I see. Go, sorry, go ahead, man. No, I think that's, that's a good place to yeah. leave it. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the call. Got to have class struggle candidates who are vocal about being socialists with uh, an independent base of power and support. That's what I will bottom line it as. Uh, Dr. Eric from Boston on uh, the IM says, uh, this whole QAnon pedophilia thing ought to raise an eyebrow. Remember the satanic panic the church was propagating in the 90s? Bad kids wearing all black were supposedly worshiping the devil and doing sexual rituals with children all along what was actually going on with priests systemically. Right, yeah. Um, uh, Tom Hopman says, here in Michigan, the public radio stations run from state colleges do a pretty good job of covering local news. Flint Water, uh, Nasser, sexual abuse, right, right. Uh, I think the problem is local news is often boring until it isn't, and a lot of people don't pay attention. That's part of it. I mean, That's it's 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 all. It. I mean, it can no local news can be great, and it has been in this country. It's all about where we are at in capitalism. It's understaffed, and half the stories come straight from the police department. Like, uh, like that's where we're at. The crime blotter and all that. Yeah. Um, uh, something Sam can pronounce says, "Love Thursdays with news buddies." Gregory says, "The voice of the Price is Right is Roddy is Rod Roddy." And he's dead. Oh, well, R.I.P. Rod Roddy. Uh, I'm glad you didn't end up doing a Huckabee show. <laughs> Your voice lives on in our memories and comes out at yes. weird times. <laughs> right. And, and where it should be and not on Huckabee show for sure. Uh, wouldn't a Mar uh, social practice says, wouldn't a Marxist want to use any means possible to push the country left? Marx critiques systems of power of which electoralism is one. We have to use it to our benefit because we need all the tools we can get. I don't know if I really want to keep having this conversation. I can see this from both sides. This is an argument going back to uh, Lenin 
and the various uh, left communists who uh, disagreed with him. Like the the goal of a communist party is to bring about communism, right? If you there is a workable theory for how participating in bourgeois parliaments sometimes will help you advance that goal. There's also been some workable theories for how they actually block that goal. And I don't think it's a settled question yet. Uh, Jamie, J- Jamie Specks uh, says, hey, Harrier Matt. Well, I guess that's me. You brought up the IDC and how they were blocking progressive policy. It's important to note that the state assembly here in New York, which was much progressive in its rhetoric, much more progressive in its rhetoric, had come out firmly against money in politics. They had a majority sign on to legislation to ban big money after the IDC was neutralized. The assembly all of a sudden didn't have the votes anymore, despite electing even more progressives in 2018. And the legislation was dead. This is the grift of our government. Uh, they are good for things when they can't pass it, as long as they can pass the blame on to Republicans. And when they have all the power, they just fall short of the votes they need. I want to love WFP, but they back some of these candidates over true progressives. And as we saw in the 2020 primary, override the will of the rank and file when leadership doesn't agree. Well, yeah, there's definitely other issues going on here. Yeah. But I mean, like you just said, now we can see which specific uh, uh, politicians, which assembly members, which state state senators were just voting yes when they were safe to do so and are now voting uh, against progressive policy now that they have to have their true colors be shown and then we could primary them. I mean, without that 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 veil of 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 secrecy that they have in terms of protecting Cuomo and other conservative Dems, we can see who the problem is and, and vote them out. I mean, that's that's my 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 take. And also with the WFP, they learn their lessons. Uh, they, I mean, I mean, they backed Cuomo first in his reelection the first time around, and that was a big mistake. And then the second time around, they went against him, backed Cynthia Nixon, which helped the ID uh, defeat the IDC, even though she lost. But her high profile campaign helped bring up the other uh, New York State Senate candidates. And, you know, I, I mean, they're not perfect. That's 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 for sure, obviously. Uh, comrade Mario says, all respect to the God Gnome, but he, if he really thinks we only have a decade or two to stop climate collapse, uh, you can't just disregard the point that the Biden administration will lull everyone into sleep for another full, for another half or full decade and we will be worse off without answering. Trump will be worse, et cetera, et cetera. How is one to respond to that? I mean, is it so bad though that some people go back to being asleep? We've already seen what happens when some people are yeah. awake and they vote for more conservative democratic candidates because they exactly. are just, they're not really involved. I mean, I've been saying this for, 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 I don't even know how long, but the blue wave wasn't progressives. The blue wave were rank and file moderate Dems. I mean, that's the blue wave and, and probably even conservatives who were voting Dem for the first time. Yeah, Blue I mean, progressive. people need to be awake in the right way. Right. Go uh, ahead, Matt. Well, you know, Matt was trying I, to I mean, it's, I, I just think this is, again, too focused on. I don't know. I don't know. We got to we got to wrap pretty soon. But I think it's just obvious the relative difference. And like, look, we're not we're not <laughs> going to have a president that's going to stop climate change from happening. It's going to happen. Um, what happens is, frankly, like things like emergency response, which I would say in the Republican hands versus Democrat hands are going to be probably handled similarly to the pandemic response. Like. I mean, don't expect that the presidential election is going to deliver you all the things you want in socialism and expect like actually it's going to take outside pressure and events that are going to impinge on and which sort of array of power they're going to impinge upon is going to have different results. That's the only way to look at elections, I think. Yeah. Uh, On the climate change tip, he said, basically, we have to believe that uh, this current system that we have of global capitalism can solve climate change other in the next 10 years. Otherwise, we are totally effed and we can never do the rev. Right. Because we'll all be dead. I am agnostic on that. I don't think that capitalism could solve this problem within the next 10 years. I would like to be wrong. And maybe I am wrong. Uh. But, you know, we still got to try. Let's do uh, plugs real quick, uh, guys. Uh, yeah, let's do it. Uh, Jamie, right. you want to start? Sure. So this week on the Antifada, uh, Sean and I had a, a bit of a chill news episode in the first half. Uh, we talked about Trump and COVID. We gave some takes on the Supreme Court. And did Senator Mike Lee out himself as a board guest? Question mark. 
this is a good transition into the second half of our episode where we talk about left-wing communism. What is it? What's its relationship to non-left communism? Is there any communism that's not left? Uh, I feel like a lot of people don't really have a good historical understanding of what this thing is beyond like a few internet memes about uh, Bordiga or Tony Pancakes. So we give some of the history of this strain of basically uh, orthodox Marxist thought that opposed a lot of the ideas of Marxist-Leninist thought, which kind of took precedence at the time that the USSR was a major world power, which makes sense, right? You want to be on the winning team. You're like, oh, well, you guys won. I guess you must be right about everything. But I I think it's actually really important to have a diversity of Marxist thought and um, think about maybe what would have happened differently if they actually would have been able to bring about full communism um, if they had taken different paths. Because as we all know, uh, the USSR ultimately failed and we are not living under full communism right now. So I think this was an interesting discussion. Hopefully you're a nerd like us and you will too. Patreon.com slash The Antifada. Uh, on TMBS this week, we had Kristen Godsey talking to Alicia Brooks about uh, why women have better sex under socialism and other uh, sort of materialist uh, issues like that. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Yeah. All right. Cool. And then that was quick. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, on uh, YouTube.com slash Matt Binder, live tonight, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I will have Matt Gertz on the show of Media Matters, and he's going to walk us through this latest attack from the right against uh, Joe Biden using these Hunter Biden uh, emails that came from a laptop dropped off at a repair shop. The whole thing has tons of misinformation around it, weird oddities, lots of conspiracies abound. What's fact? What's fiction? What's weird? What just doesn't make sense? We'll break it all down tonight on Doomed. You can catch it again live, 9 p.m. at youtube.com slash Matt Binder. Then the podcast will go up at doomedpod.com. And if you want to support the show, you could go to patreon.com slash Matt Binder and really support all the work I do, whether it be the newsletter that I write at missinfo.com or the, the show on YouTube and, and the podcast version too. So that's uh, youtube.com slash Matt Binder tonight, 9 p.m. Eastern time live. Uh, I guess that's the uh, show for today, guys, right? Yep. Folks, uh, uh, Brendan, who do we have tomorrow? We have Benjamin Dixon and the guys from, uh, and we have David Reese. Who has oh, his, nice. Yeah. He's very funny. Uh, all right, folks, we will see you then, Matt and Jamie. Thank you so much. Uh, see you guys next week in the same uh, uh, formation. Thank you. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid.